I'm Gary YouTube from Cultaholic.com and welcome back to the latest thrilling instalment in the tier list series that is never ever going to end. Joined as always by another Gary YouTube who this time has the bobbled hat of some sort of American sports team owned by Jack the Jobber. How are you doing Gary? I'm not too bad. Gary, how are you? I absolutely am. What's the word? I'm too excited for the biggest party of the summer that we won't see coming this year. It's today. Yeah, it's, it's, is that the tagline? You'll never see it coming. You'll never see it coming, but it's this Sunday, live on the WWE Network. It's hitting at Ric Flair, isn't it? Is it? Maybe? Oh, yeah, it must be. All retribution. Must, all retribution. The possibilities are endless. What we do know is that SummerSlam 2020 will be the 33rd instalment of the biggest party of the summer. What it will be like, we have no idea. Yeah, I haven't got too long to wait, though, because, as I said, it is tonight, but you will not see it coming. What you will see coming, though, is this tier list thing. Hit the intro, Sam. Hopefully you see that, too. Just in case you haven't been here before, obviously because we are Gary YouTubers doing this Gary YouTube thing. We have a tier list ranking thing here with several tiers. The best, lovely, 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 all right, just about bearable and get in the bin. Every single tier will be filled. I've got a strong feeling about that one. But we're going back to the first ever SummerSlam, Jack, 1988, when we weren't even born. Uh, I, think, I think it's a really good one. Rock, Gary, Rock, Gary. Just do Ross. People get sick of it I'll, after a I'll while. I think it's a really good one, Ross. Yeah. <laughs> do you? So do I. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's one that was full of iconic moments. Of course, uh, the most iconic moment of all was Elizabeth. Whapping off her skirt, getting her legs out for the lads, even though Randy wasn't too much of a fan of it. But uh, I think it was Gorilla Monsoon on commentary, re reacting as if he'd never seen a, a, a pair of lady legs before. It was just, you know, it was what 1988 was all about. How different times were. When yes. <laughs> someone revealing their legs could distract the heels so much. But uh, it was Miss Elizabeth. She was such a lady, Jack. She never got the legs out. She's always wearing elegant dresses and whatnot. But there she was trying to distract uh, Andre the Giant and Ted DiBiase to, to good effect as well. I love that picture. of there's, there's the picture after they've won of them all posing. And Macho Man and Hogan look so huge. It's ridiculous <laughs> and tanned. And it's just, yeah. the, it's very 80s. And Elizabeth is like five yards behind, but it looks like she's several miles behind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but on top of that, we've got to talk about the more iconic moments. Ultimate Warrior making that surprise uh, appearance to end Honky Tonk Man's record breaking. Well, it's still the record, isn't it, for the longest ever single Intercontinental Championship reign. Uh, Rick Rude as well, I want to mention for his tights with Jake the, well, then Jake the Snake Roberts' wife Cheryl on them, which got Jake the Snake all kinds of mad. All good stuff. Any more stuff from uh, SummerSlam 1988 you can recall uh, off the top I've, of your bobble hat? I've got a good tag match between the Bulldogs and the Rougeos as well. Which, that does sound like it would be good. Which may have been the first, I think I might be right in saying, was the first proper match in SummerSlam history, and it was a good one. Sign of things to come. Yeah. 1988, I reckon, has got to be one of the top two tiers. I think we're going straight into the top tier, mate. I think oh it's, well, it's really good. Why not? It's the biggest party of the summer. It's biggest, <laughs> just, that's, that's next several Jaeger bombs right now before the night's even begun. But I found it. Justin Henry, by the way, who writes for Cultaholic.com, is a wonderful, wonderful human being. He's done these uh, behind-the-scenes sort of uh, pieces about SummerSlam history. And I found out by reading his 1988 piece, all available, of course, Cultaholic.com, um, at the Superstars and Challengers taping sessions before SummerSlam, Ultimate Warrior had to win the Intercontinental title from Honky Tonk Man because they were recording episodes of Superstars and WWE Challenge, or WF Challenge that were airing after SummerSlam, which I found incredibly interesting. The people who were there watching those tapings knew what was coming at SummerSlam. Well, Incredible. What could they do? They couldn't tell anyone. They couldn't get no. on Twitter. Obviously, Honky Tonk would get the... I think you got it back on a technicality right at the end of the night, but I, thought, I found that astonishing, how like thousands of people just saw Ultimate Warrior end what was then and still is the record-breaking reign, and then it was just sort of like, oh, he's got it back now. Ha, <laughs> shut up. Yeah, I, thought it was amazing. I, didn't, I didn't know that, and it spoiled the magic slightly for me, but not enough to knock it down from the top tier. Yeah. Um, next up, we are going to 1989. When I say SummerSlam 1989, what is coming to your head? 
Um, not as much as oh Zeus, the hair, obviously. Oh yes. Oh, oh yes. no, not as good. Oh yes, not as good a year <laughs> as eighty eight. This is a weird, a weird time in WWE history where we had a film involving Hulk Hogan and this fictional man called Zeus. And because Hulk Hogan beat Zeus in the film, Zeus had to come into the World Wrestling Federation and get his own back on Hulk Hogan. And I found a bit more. Justin Henry's coming out with all these stats and facts. It's unbelievable. Cultaholic.com, once again, <laughs> if you want to read them for yourself. Apparently, Zeus would get a little bit too aggressive. And in response, either Hogan or Beefcake, who, of course, were teaming up to take on Zeus and the Macho Man, they would shout... For or not shout, they would go free James Brown in <laughs> Zeus's ear. Wow. And that would make that would make Zeus giggle and make him sort of loosen up a bit and relax and stop potato and the poo out of them. What? I found that an astonishing thing. Was it Just was it Savage or was it Piper? Have I written it wrong? Savage. Was it Savage? Savage. My notes yeah. are wrong. Excellent. <laughs> um, anything else from uh, SummerSlam nineteen eighty nine that comes to your mind? Because uh, that of course was uh, it was crap, of course. Yeah, it wasn't as good. Uh, I've got two matches written down that were decent, apparently, even though I can only remember one of them, uh, which is Warrior versus Rude for the IC belt. Another win for Warrior there. Or was it? No, hang on. Was that later on? Yeah, Warrior Yeah, Warrior versus Rude IC title. It went over 15 minutes, Jack, and it was still a good match. For Warrior, that's in- for Rick Warrior, Rude, it's incredible. Rick Rude must have put in a shift. Yeah. Uh, and also the Brain Busters versus the Heart Foundation. And that you don't need to say anything more about that, do no. you? Technical masterpiece, probably. Well, I've not, I've, I've not, I can't remember it. It might be, it might be dreadful. No, I saw a little bit of it, and it's okay. everything you would expect okay. and more. But I found, thanks to Justin Henry once again, you're going to hear that name a lot <laughs> during the course of this video. Cultaholic.com, if you want to read them for yourself. He's found a bit more that uh, the the heart, sorry, were very upset by the book and them losing, of course, to the Brain Busters. And uh, Jim and Brett, they left before the show ended. And then they had to pay for their own flights home. And Brett was moaning about financial strife and all that stuff. He nearly quit. He sent out feelers to WCW, but nothing came of it because it didn't offer him as much money as he was making with Vince McMahon. I can understand if they'd lost to like the Killer Bees, but it's the Brave. Yeah. It's on until he. I know, but that's Brett, isn't it? Brett's that's Brett. Know. Yeah, I suppose so. And of course, we cannot talk about SummerSlam 1989 without. Potentially the greatest moment in SummerSlam history. Mean F and Gene. He's doing that interview with Rick Rude. The sign falls off the wall. <laughs> they, of course, reshot that because Mean Gene swe- uh, he swore a couple of times. But <laughs> WWF, whoever was in charge back then, maybe it was Kevin Dunn, maybe it wasn't. They put in the wrong version. And the world saw Mean Gene swear. <laughs> but still, so that doesn't... Have, this is, is this the bin or is it just about bearable? I, I think be- because it seems to have a decent couple of undercard matches, I feel like it's got to be second bottom tier, not not the bin. Would yeah. you agree? It's just a, yeah, it's just Zeus and all that, and just the very concept of it. Never mind the action inside the ring. Yeah, not that a fan, would be in the bin. Yeah, not a fan of of a fictional man. It's like when Robocop showed up to save Sting. I mean, that was fantastic. Okay, though, wasn't right, it? sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I get what you're saying. It was just a load of crap. Anyway, 1990, Jack, when I say SummerSlam 1990 to you, what is coming into your head? 1990 was, I've written here in my notes, a stacked card, but largely disappointing in, in, in practice. So good on mm-hmm. paper, bad in practice. Like, like Man City in the Champions League this year. To- so topical. Hey. Uh, <laughs> so we had Warrior versus Rude in the Steel Cage. Another Warrior Rude match. Uh, we had Hogan versus Earthquake, and and I'm a big fan. When you watch Earthquake back, I think Earthquake was good. I like a bit he of Earthquake. He was good. He could do everything. Earthquake, uh, sumo the lot. Yeah. And then Savage versus Dusty, which sounds like a dream, an absolute dream match, but wasn't very good. Mm. So uh, I don't know what to make of it. Really, it's not. It's the first one for me that really lacks an absolute iconic moment. The first SummerSlam out of the first three that really doesn't have that next thing to take it to the next level what are you talking about because the million dollar man he bought a human being yeah. he bought Sapphire from Dusty it's what everyone wants to see yeah that's really uncomfortable isn't it that's really bad <laughs> that's really really bad iconic moment but not the kind of iconic you want to have no. on your wrestling show um, this was a thing a trend count outs DQs and big matches Earthquake versus Hogan Hogan won via count out this is a horrible trend that was starting at SummerSlam and it always even though it was you know it was always the biggest part of the summer even if it wasn't by name every single year they always seemed to end with some sort of DQ count out thing some sort of buggery some sort of poo housery it was never very good in the early days I was saying no and and I don't know I don't know what the point of all the count outs was was it to protect them for Wrestlemania or later shows or 
potentially Sur- Survivor yeah. Series. I don't know. It's weird though because historically this is one of the big four. Surely you would think that WrestleMania caliber matches would have definitive finishes. Um, but we look further down the card, Jack, and we see Power and Glory taking on the Rockers, which was ruined, of course, by Shawn Michaels having a big injury, meaning he couldn't take part. Meaning Marty Jannetty, everyone's favourite wrestler, yeah, in August 2020, had to do a lot of the work there. And I'm just m- mentioning these things because uh, SummerSlam 1990 was a bit of a hodgepodge, a bit of an event that was thrown together at the last minute. The Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Erich, replaced Brutus Beefcake in the IC title match against Mr. Perfect because of that horrible... Was it the jet skis? It was something like that, wasn't it, on the beach? That uh, sort of made a mess of Mr. Uh, oh. Beefcake for a couple of years there. It nearly ended his career, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you had to take a couple of years away because of a horrible, horrible Did he get hit by a paraglider? Something like that. It was something beach-related and something very horrible. Thankfully, he recovered. Mm. Um, But I just mentioned that because SummerSlam 1989 was sort of hampered by sort of a couple of matches being thrown together at the last minute because of circumstances outside of Vince McMahon's hands. But I'm looking at this tier-ranking tier and I think we're bottom two tiers again. Me too. And I don't think... I think it was more underwhelming than than bin. I, I don't. Yeah. Wanna, I don't want to see it in the bin, but but it wasn't as good as it should have been. When you look at the lineup, it's up. It's so stacked, and then it just didn't didn't really didn't really pay off like they'd liked it. Like like they'd have liked it too. There we go. We'll put it just about bearable because you know Sapphire got bought. Oh. Them. Don't move on. <laughs> anyway, 1991. We go on to this was a period of time in WWE history where there was a massive cloud hanging over after Hulk Hogan's appearance on the Arsenio Hall show that kicked off all kind of steroid accusations and made professional wrestling look quite bad. Hmm. It seemed like it was all kicking off on the. I've only seen two Arsenio Hall interviews ever. One's the Hogan one. And one's an interview with uh, Snoop Dogg, who uh, who does a freestyle rap and just calls out members of the NWA. Not that NWA, the the rap group, the NWA, and kicked off a bit of a bit of a fracas. So it just all seems to kick off. Arsenio gets all the scoops. Would you like to recreate this um, this rap? I can't remember exactly how it went, but it was very skillful. I was really impressed by a, a young Snoop Dogg, and he looks so young as well. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to go near that's it. Just, that's just, that's a shame. Sorry, dear viewer. Anyway, we have that cloud hanging over WWE. Then we have the Ultimate Warrior shaped crowd because this is around the time where he wasn't happy with what was going on. He basically held Vince up for a lot of money. And when he arrived backstage at SummerSlam 1991, Jack, he was basically told, "You can him," no. as we would say here in Newcastle upon time. You're going home after this event. You horrible bastard. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was a weird this was this was the event, wasn't it? The match made in heaven, the match made in hell. Yeah. Now the match made in hell, I guess we'll start there because this this uh, this was the match that Warrior was in. Yeah. The match made in hell was Hogan and Warrior against Slaughter and his lads. Three of them. So it was a handicap. All match. the lads. Yeah. So to me, match made in hell sounds like an Undertaker match or like some kind of spooky match involving so not 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 you know, Hogan and Warrior beating up a load of foreign heels. You would think it would be match made in space, you know, Warrior talking about the yeah. spaceships and all that malarkey and Hogan just bashed off his face on it. <laughs> He's away with the fairies, isn't he? But yeah, it was Slaughter, Mustafa and General Adnan taking on uh, Hogan and Warrior. The main event of the night, of course, wasn't a professional wrestling match. It was a wrestling wedding. And if you tell me you didn't cry, I'll tell you you're a massive liar. Fantastic stuff. Cry with joy at the wedding or sadness at, at Roberts and Undertaker ruining it. Both. All Both. of the tears. Right. All of the tears. It was a roller coaster of emotions. One second, you're that guy with the yellow hat in the crowd, proper like, <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, and then it's uh, tears of tears of absolute fear as a snake comes out of box. Terrifying. Yeah. It doesn't sound as innuendo as that, but you know. <laughs> it, 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 if it happened these days, actually, to be fair, I wouldn't put it past WWE to do something like that in this current hey, Brucey, era. Brucey e. Pig is back with piss. Do you see that on SmackDown? No. AJ Styles is phenomenal intercontinental oh. statistics system yeah. or something. Yeah. Piss. <laughs> anyway, this was also the event where Bret Hart won his first singles title in WWE. Had that match with Mr. Perfect, a fantastic match. And then we had the stuff with the Mountie in jail and what might and might not have happened to him when he got into jail at the hands of the big boss man. That's a uh, bit up in the air, you know? <laughs> uh, some, of the, some of the angles were absolutely mad back in the day. 
You, you know, people say that, you know, late 80s, early 90s WF was for the kids. It was all the cartoon era and stuff. But you see the amount he go to real life prison and potentially have some horrible things done to him. And I'm, I'm saying it's something very different. But SummerSlam 1991... It's the wedding, isn't it? It's it's the wedding. Can yeah. We put, can we put the wedding any lower than lovely, lovely, lovely? Oh, or I was going to say high? I was going to say middle. But if you're fighting for lovely, 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 then maybe. I mean, I guess it did have Brett Perfect as well. Yeah. Oh, go on then. We'll go lovely, lovely, lovely. It is. Is it still the most iconic SummerSlam moment? Potentially the wedding. Is it? Oh, it's up there. Yeah, it's in the it's conversation. Maybe, um, maybe for, not not for English people, as we'll find out in a bit. In obviously, a sec. yeah, yeah. yeah. Patriotism and all that. We're mm. going straight, of course, to 1992, the greatest year in the history of this earth, because it's the year that me and Jack were born. Yes. Yes. We're like we're, we're three months apart, believe it or not, not several years. Um, <laughs> 1992. I didn't know this, but 11 matches took place inside Wembley Stadium that night. But obviously, with Americans seeing it on tape delay, only eight aired on the American version. That's oh. The Americans didn't get to see classics like Tatanka versus Berserker, Tito Santana versus Papa Shanko, or a six-man tag team match featuring Hacksaw Jim Duggan and the Bushwhackers taking on the Mountie and the Nasty Boys, and ah, they got robbed. Yeah, well, <laughs> that last you, match especially, they got no, robbed. Uh, Tito and Shanko might have been interesting. I don't know about <laughs> that last one. <laughs> Um, obviously the big highlight from the night especially us because we're all patriots, patri- patriotic and all that and Britain and, oh, not like that no, not Britain first not that way just you know a, wait, English a, lad doing well more he's from world, Manchester more in a World Cup he, way more in a he's gone, yeah. he's gone down down the big city he's gone down to London and he's won the intercontinental title from, he, I'm he, just going to stop no, anyway no, Bulldog no, he's good yeah, thanks. Uh, Bulldog versus Bret Hart in the Continental title. You've seen it a million times. Bulldog with the roller package thingy, the emotional scenes with his wife inside the ring, after the bell, the fireworks and all of that. We all know the, the sort of backstory to that match with Bulldog not being all there and Bret Hart carrying him to one hell of a match anyway. Um, on top of that, what are you saying apart, uh, for SummerSlam 1992? Well, just first of all, was... Was this the one where the kid, or was that at a rumble, where the kid goes, Bulldog's going to win whether he wants to or not? That was, that was SummerSlam 92, wasn't that it? Was just outside no, of Wembley. He's, yeah. he's my favourite part of the show, that kid. <laughs> he's fantastic. Uh, Someone was selling an action figure of him, weren't they, not too long ago? They need a, Did you get yours? They were doing this right up until like the mid-2000s. They need to go back to interviewing fans before the show and find out who they think is going to win the big matches. It's really oh, good. It's a ris- risky business now, though, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. You wouldn't, get, you wouldn't get smarks back then, though. You'd get people genuinely excited, but nowadays you'd probably get people going like, well... The most over person, it would it just wouldn't be as wouldn't yeah. be as innocent. Um, Warrior versus Savage. Yes, we had Flair and Perfect on the outside of the ring, causing all kinds of havoc. Undertaker's entrance, Road Warrior's entrance, another iconic pair of moments that springs to my mind. We had Kamala, of course, who Matthew likes to mention on the Cult of Hot Wrestling podcast, available every single Friday on this YouTube channel. The plugs are endless today. The Kamala threatened to cook the Undertaker, and that made Matthew laugh lots. <laughs> yeah. Nails. Nails, we had the backstory there. Nails wrestles Virgil for like three minutes, 55 seconds or something like that. And then moaned and got getting paid eight or nine thousand dollars for that. I wish I was getting that sort of rate <laughs> for my work here at Cult Holic. Um, Shawn Michaels and Rick Martell in a match that shouldn't have worked. That was a match that did very much work too. Just very entertaining, sexy heels going at it. Mm. And a concept that shouldn't work because they're both heels, but the, because they're so good. It did. Anything else about SummerSlam 1992 that's going to... Take it out of the top tier. It's got to be in the top tier, hasn't it? I think it's got to be in the top tier. And also, it's got one of the best pops in wrestling history when Bulldog finally wins. It's like a Definite. goal. It's like a goal has been scored. It's not like a wrestling pop. It's like a, it's like a goal in, well, in a football. it is Wembley Stadium. True. Yeah, true. So, sir, we have SummerSlam 1992. Believe me, that picture does say 1992. I've picked some horrible, horrible pictures here. I was in a bit of a rush. I do apologise. But SummerSlam 1992 is in the top tier. And we move on to SummerSlam 1993. And we've just been in the top tier, but we might be going all the way down to the bottom, Jack, because this was a load of bollocks. This one's this one's been for me, I think, Ross. I'm just going to say that it's straight got, away. It's got to be a bin, hasn't it? The, the ending to this night is terrible. He was happy he'd won. He got his pay packet for picking up the victory. No. So if anyone's <laughs> not seen it, Lex Luger beats Yokozuna by count out. So he doesn't win the belt in the main event. You'd think he'd be sad. But no, it kicks off the mother of all celebrations for a count-out win. There's red, white, and blue 
Is it balloons or confetti or something? There's balloons, streamers, confetti, everything that screams America. You've got whatever that meme is. I think Babyface is coming out the locker room to lift him up and celebrate with him because he's won by countdown. <laughs> and he hasn't won the title, which is the sole goal he had heading into that match. But he did it for America against the dirty foreigner, as yeah. I like to do that storyline way back in the day. Um, speaking about the absolute. I nearly said a, a rude word there, sorry. The crap show that was SummerSlam 1993. We had Undertaker versus Giant Gonzalez. The rematch, WrestleMania 9, wasn't enough for Vince McMahon. After the chloroform and all of that bollocks, we had to have another helping, and that was absolutely fantastic. We had Shawn Michaels versus Mr. Perfect, which was a fine match, but once again, it continued the weird trend at SummerSlam of big countouts and all that malarkey, weird, screwy finishes. Um, then we had Bret Hart versus Jerry the King Lawler, and once again, we're going to refer to one of Justin Henry's wonderful articles on cultaholic.com because he found out, well, he, it, he, claimed, he might be lying. He's not lying, of course. I'm taking the piss. Um, he said that because of like there was an incident involving a, a throne, an incident involving some sort of uh, was it a, 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 a crutch? They went wrong, and they hurt Bret Hart so much that Bret Hart and his famously his famous impossibly long sharpshooter was a, a receipt to Jerry the King Lawler, who was the guy delivering the crutch, which hit him in the face or something and caused some sort of damage. There was the throne that went wrong somewhere, so Brett was like, I'm going to get my own back on you, Jerry, by locking in a three and a half minute sharpshooter oh. and wrenching back a bit too hard. Would it? Oh, the sharpshooters actually were? Apparently. I imagine so, if you wrench back hard enough. Yeah. It's like when you used to, did you ever get put in the walls of Jericho when you were at school? No, I, I'm an older brother, so I put my brother in the walls of Jericho, but I don't think I've ever been in one. Oh, I've been in it. It's not a, not a fun time. Okay. So I imagine the sharpshooter is pretty much the same. Um, anything else about SummerSlam 1993 that's jumping out to you that's, that's going to keep it from going in the bin? No, I think it's got to be the bin for me. And then we're going to SummerSlam 1994, which is famous most for The Undertaker versus Undertaker, or, un, or sorry, Thundertaker, as I've oh. seen in my research today, which I never knew was a thing. Why is he that? I don't know. Undertaker versus Thundertaker. It's a thing that apparently was part of the show. Thundertaker. Thundertaker. I've never heard that before in my life. I've just always heard him referred to as the fake Undertaker. Yeah, Undertaker. Anyway, that's a name yeah. you may or may not have had. It might be a load of bollocks. I've got no idea. But I found an interesting thing once again, courtesy of Justin Henry at Cultaholic.com. Just incredible. Got a job by training with Brian Lee, who was the Undertaker. Vince McMahon, Undertaker, Pat Patterson rock up to the training days before SummerSlam. They see Just Incredible working with Brian Lee, and that got him a job. And I thought that was quite a wholesome story to mention here on this tier ranking thing, even though it's got nothing to do with SummerSlam 1994. What are you saying about SummerSlam 1994? It's the Bruce Hart show. <laughs> Absolutely love a bit of Bruce. <laughs> so. <laughs> So Bruce Hart's a weird figure in wrestling, isn't he? Because he's from arguably the most talented wrestling family ever. But he's not he's not as good as he. He's not as good as No, Bret he, Owen. Is, he is. He believes inside of his own head that he is better than Bret Hart. But he thinks he's better, yeah. So whenever he's involved in an angle, usually one involving Hart family drama, uh, he always just tries to make himself the star of the show, forgetting that he's Bruce Hart. Yeah, and he's not Brett, or he's not Owen. No. Of course, Owen and Brett in this instance, they did have that steel cage match for the world title. All sorts of buggery happens at the, fi at the final whistle. At the final whistle, I've just <laughs> said there. After the final <laughs> bell, with Jim Neidhart getting in the ring, the rest of the hearts get in the ring, and this is where Bruce gets on the ropes. Uh, on, the, on the cage, actually. And he makes it all about Bruce. Uh, Razor <laughs> Ramon, outside of here. Le less about Bruce Hart, the better, anyway. Uh, Razor Ramon versus Diesel for the IC title. That was also a good match, just like Owen versus Brett was. Um, what else we're saying here? Jeff Jarrett defeated the monstrous Mabel. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. I didn't know that. I don't uh, think I've seen that match. Apparently, huh. Jarrett was supposed to face Doink originally, and then Mabel doesn't even know why he was swapped in. He did a shoot interview years later, and he had no idea why he was wrestling Jeff Jarrett at SummerSlam 1994, but he did anyway. Anything else about SummerSlam 1994 that's uh, sticking out in your mind? Just that just the, the fake stuff... The fake Undertaker, it's not, it didn't work. I feel like it was a gamble and it didn't pay off. No. I guess on paper it's sort of cool because <laughs> uh, yeah. it's sort of like a mystical character. But I did, it's once again, it's from Justin's. I'm going to stop saying Justin's name, I said it too much. Apparently, the original finish, or the originally pitched finish, was for another Lights and Magic show with both Undertaker standing in the ring. This is at the end of the match between those two. Somehow, yeah. some way, through an unexplained act that goes beyond mere humanity, the two Undertakers were so would somehow merge. 
When the lights came, <laughs> when the lights came back on, the original pitch is that the two undertakers would have merged, and then Mark Calloway, the undertaker, would have been stood there when the lights came back on. And I think it's a crying shame that <coughs> didn't actually happen. Imagine Leslie Nielsen if that had happened; it would have been fantastic. Wait, so then, for the rest of the Undertaker's career, he's fighting with the strength of two men. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's dreadful. No, I'm glad that didn't happen. That's really bad. <laughs> he would have been unbeatable. Anyway, SummerSlam... Like... If the... No, they should have put a suit on him so he's got an extra pair of arms and an extra pair of legs Just and an extra, like... I a massive fat suit to make him twice as thick. Yeah. Anyway, SummerSlam 1994. I reckon, you know, we can, we can lambast Undertaker versus Undertaker all we want, but Brett versus Owen was good. Razor versus Diesel was good. Jeff Jarrett beat Mabel. I don't know why that's in my notes, but it is uh, all right. Go on then, yeah. We're all yeah. right. The, the, cage, the cage match was very good alone. Yeah. So. Uh, next up, obviously, we're going to 1995. SummerSlam 95, what's coming into your mind, Jack the Jobber? Oh, I've lost it. I've absolutely lost it, which might be telling. Was it a very memorable SummerSlam or not? I don't think Where's so. Where's 95? I'll tell you why it wasn't oh. memorable, Jack, because the main event was Mabel versus Diesel. Oh, yes, I've just found it in the nick of time. I've got here Mabel versus Diesel, perhaps the worst main event in SummerSlam history. 2010? Oh, no, that would have had good wrestling. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but Mabel versus Diesel... It did have redeeming features, though, the, the event. It wasn't just, like, a terrible car crash from start to finish because it had another Sean Razor ladder match. It was a one match, a card, rematch. wasn't it, at the end of the day? This was just the, the match sort that of, carried yeah. the show. Um, Michael's got the win, even though he threw a tantrum right at the end of the match because his ladder broke in the, the final stage of the match, which is always uncomfortable to watch when Shawn Michaels throws a tantrum. But funny all the same, really looking back. Um, I was... I was watching one today, just today, from a SummerSlam that we're going to get to in a second. Another example of Shawn Michaels throwing a tantrum, but we'll get. Oh, I'm sure we'll get onto that in Move. just a second. Ah, that's the one. That one. Yeah. That little. That little one. Anyway, yeah. uh, this match. I think we need to put more respect, per, as Ali G would say, on the name of this match because Vince McMahon told Shawn and Razor they couldn't use the ladder as a weapon, but allegedly it was Triple H who told them, lads, you can still use it as like a thing in the corner, an Irish whip people in, you can still sort of jump off it and do cool things. So they were handicapped by Vince McMahon's weird... I guess, is it weird? Not wanting yeah, it's so, weird. Not wanting so much violence and a very violent stipulation, but they still managed to pull it out the bag. Uh, he's so cerebral. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, is this Triple H or Vince? Triple H, Triple H is so cerebral. And I tell you what, going back in my um, research for this one, Barry Horowitz gets a win over Skip from the Body Donners, and it's a good match. I watched it, almost all of it, and it's just a good wrestling match. And obviously when Big Barry gets the win, Big Baz, everyone loves Big Baz, limbs yeah. are everywhere because it's Barry Horowitz getting the pay-per-view victory in WWE. Anything else about SummerSlam 95 that you want to mention right now? No, I can't think of anything apart from just that I wish that happened more these days. I wish that you know, jobbers or lower card guys would just get a win out of nowhere at some point. The only one I can remember in recent memory was uh, Ryder and Hawkins winning, but that was that was built up to. That was at WrestleMania, so on the pre-show, yeah, but it was still, everyone knew it was going to happen. Yeah. Heath, so, Slater, Heath Slater did one as well, didn't he, in recent years? Who did he beat? Oh. Uh, was it Rollins? Oh, did he? Rollins on Raw, wasn't no that way. I think he did on Raw a couple of years ago. I might be wrong there. Wow. I think I'm right, though. Anyway, also, I guess we have to mention at SummerSlam 95, we had Undertaker versus Kama Mustafa, the big... F or was he a fighting machine by that point? I don't think he was. Maybe it was just Kama. <laughs> and then we have Bret Hart versus Isaac Yankum, DDS, Britt Baker's biological father. But SummerSlam <laughs> 1995, um, is it going quite low down? Is it going mid-range? Where do you think? It's it's hard because I think the terrible main event's obviously a bad point for it, but I reckon that the ladder match and just Barry getting a big win makes it all right. I'll go with that. That ladder match yes. was that good, especially when you know that they had like you can't use it as a weapon to hit them on the heads with as a, a sort of rule put on them. Then we're going to 1996, and the first thing for me that comes to my mind is Undertaker versus Mankind in that boiler room brawl where Mankind, I think, got some sort of sciatic oh. injury when he fell off the massive ladder and didn't quite hit the, the crushed boxes on the floor properly. His arse and his legs fell on the concrete floor and that made a mess of him. Tager and, Tager and Mankind, their feud might be the most scary feud of all time, just yeah. from the matches that happened. Obviously, the King of the Ring one. But, yeah, this was... I remember reading somewhere 
and including it in my notes saying like this is what people thought but I just read it somewhere and I'd never heard it before but it was quite interesting apparently this boiler room brawl really set the stage for like WWE's hardcore, hardcore style around this time heading into the Attitude Era so I didn't know that apparently it was a bit of a pioneer of a match you got to think about the other examples around that time what was there P- Piper, and, yeah. Piper and Goldust maybe that was about it true for that Very kind true. of thing so yeah Maybe it did, but we're here speaking about, of course, the biggest party of the summer, WWE SummerSlam. But heels went over in six of the eight matches on this card. And what kind, oh, of, a wow. part, what kind of a cut? What kind of a party is that? That's very sad. It is That's very sad indeed, especially compared to. I remember thinking the exact opposite of last year's SummerSlam, which is a big feel-good event, mm. and all the all the lads won. We'll talk about that at the end, obviously. But yeah. Uh, Shawn Michaels versus Vader. Jack, I'll let you speak about the thing you wanted to speak about just earlier then. Oh, poor, poor Vader. Because apparently at the time, Vader was like a huge, terrifying guy, but really like gentle and, and a bit mild. And then Shawn would always like threaten him on the house show circuit, saying, if you ever pull my hair again, I'll get you fired. And then in this match, Shawn goes up top, goes for the elbow drop, but Vader's meant to roll out the way. Vader forgets to roll out the way. So Sean lands on his feet instead and just boots Vader in the, in the skull out of anger and shouts, move! And Vader somehow doesn't rise up and destroy Shawn Michaels. Oh, no. Because if he had, it would, have been, it would have been fantastic. Yeah. It was that thing, wasn't it, where after this SummerSlam, they were supposed to go on and face each other at Survivor Series. I think Vader was supposed to win the title at, at SummerSlam. No, was he supposed to win at Survivor Series? And then Shawn was to win it back at the Royal Rumble in San Antonio in 1997. Because of mm. this, and because Shawn didn't like working with Vader, Vader never got to win the title. So sad. Sean, Sean's really annoyed. He throws a bit of a tantrum apart from that as well, where later on he's selling on the floor and all like, the lasses in the crowd are really worried about Sean and he's being a super baby face. And then the camera like zooms in to get him selling and he just slaps the camera away. What a, what a face. What a petulant bastard. Anyway, <laughs> elsewhere on the card, we had Jake the Snake Roberts versus Jerry Lawler, believe it or not, in 1996 and a few that sur- well, revolved around... Jake the Snake Roberts uh, issues with alcohol. That always goes well in WWE, as we've seen not too long ago with Jeff Hardy, of course. The new Rockers were on the card. Who are the new Rockers, are you ask? You've got Marty and Al Snow. That's a, that's a thing that happened. Uh, a shout-out I've got written in my notes here to Mark Miro, who did his wild thing. Do you know what Mark Miro's wild thing is? Was it a move? A it taunt? was a move. It wasn't Sable. Not even his winky jack. It was a shooting star press in 1996 in WWE. Wow. Could you imagine the scenes? That was, It's groundbreaking stuff, I think, in WWE. <laughs> Limbs in the crowd. Everyone <laughs> just goes crazy. Um, uh, what we have in here? Bulldog. Mm. Bulldog versus Warrior. That's another thing that happened. It sounds like a good. It sounds like a good show. It it's sounds a, like a good it's one. It's a stack one with big names, but I'm not sure that the the big matches sort of hit the heights that maybe they should have. Obviously, Mankind versus Taker was groundbreaking in many respects, and we all look look back at that. It's some iconic stuff with how you know Mankind fell off the the ladder and whatnot, and how that match ended. And but you're looking elsewhere on the card, and there's not too much. Obviously, people remember the Shawn Michaels incident, but not for all the right reasons. I feel like it. I feel like it might deserve. It deserves either middle or lovely, lovely, lovely. But I don't know which. Should we go all right? Go on then. We'll go all right. But we'll because of Sean throwing Sean. a tantrum at the end, he could have had it in the second tier, but he's he's ruined that. Spoil sport. Then we're going on to 1997. Uh, what's coming into your mind when you see about 1997? 1997. So it's it's the Attitude Era. Oh I'm, yes. I've got big things in mind when I look for it. Oh yes. No, hang on. Yes, right, okay. So the big thing that everyone remembers is, a, is actually a bad thing. Mm-hmm. That was Austin having his neck broken in that match with Owen Hart. But still winning with a broken freaking neck. Wait, because it was the, sti- that... the stipulation, wasn't it? If, right. he, if he lost, he had to kiss Owen's arse. <laughs> and, and could the, you and imagine? The, uh, and the Attitude Era would never have got going. <laughs> yeah, the lead, I always think about that, because before uh, this week, someone was saying the king, was it King Booker? Booker T saying the King of the Ring should be should just go away for a bit and never come back. Right. I always think about you know how when you win King of the Ring these days you have to become a king. Imagine if Stone Cold Steve Austin became a king in 1996. <laughs> well, we wouldn't be sat here talking about wrestling. I don't think. <laughs> no, no, it would have been dreadful. Uh, that that was that was a bad a bad thing on the show. But it has a, a main event that I really enjoy. Um, Brett versus Taker. 
because of the because of the <clears throat> excuse me the stipulation with Sean as the special guest ref, and Sean has to count the pin for Brett, even though he hates him. And he looks at him like a python, like a python that's yeah. risen out of some sort of basket, just staring him in the eyes when he's counting to three. Wonderful drama. They were, they were good, those two, yeah. despite you know really hating each other in real life as I well. I imagine if they liked each other, what could have been? Yeah. Uh, on top of that, Jack, we of course saw the Legion of Doom versus the Godwins. <laughs> and then we saw the British Bulldog uh, defeat Ken Shamrock for the, I think it was the European, was it European or Intercontinental? I can't remember which one it was. He saw him defeat... Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if Ken was ever Intercontinental champion. Yeah, he was, yeah. Maybe. He was. Yeah. Was that the feud with The Rock? Was yes. he IC champion? Oh, right. I sorry. Think so. Sorry about that. I might have That's just talked absolute bollocks there. I always picture, it might just be on my SmackDown 1 game that he was Intercontinental champion, come to think of it. Who I knows? might have made a huge mistake. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, dear. But we had uh, Bulldog defeat Ken Shamrock because Ken, as he so often did back then, he would lose the plot and throw several men around the wrestling ring. This time, the men in question were like Sir Gerald Briscoe and Pat Patterson. And because of the way Ken Shamrock man handled them, in the future, when they would do this spot, they would uh, get independent wrestlers to come in because Pat and Gerald, they couldn't take the beating that was coming their way from Ken. <laughs> That's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Ken needs to learn to calm down a little bit. I know he was like a UFC bloke at the time and doing all this stuff, but come on, play the game, Ken. Yeah, right. But uh, I guess I should mention as well because a lot of it's a big debate, isn't it? When did the Attitude Era start? Some people say it's Shawn Michaels in a pair of shorts. Some people say it's at the SummerSlam when Shawn Michaels hits Undertaker on the head with that chair with a horrible, stiff, horrible shot. When you look back at it, um, for me, I mean, for me, it's the it's the Austin promo. It's not here. Mm. It's 316. But I get that various people have various different starting points, so I'm not sure. But it's it's a it's a valid it's a valid play because the chair shot's really nasty. Yeah, it's horrible. Uh, so if we're saying 1996, all right, I've got to say 1997. I think 1997 was better personally. Probably, yeah, on balance, yeah. Do you think it edges into lovely, lovely, lovely? Maybe. Or is it the top of all right? I'll let you I'll let you decide on that one. Oh no. Uh I'll go for the the top of all right because even though it worked out well in the end, Austin breaking his neck did not make for a good finish to that match. Fair enough. SummerSlam nineteen ninety eight. Uh it's got one of my favourite SummerSlam matches between two of my favourite guys. Is Triple it? H and the Rock. Oh, I thought you were gonna say Jeff Jarrett next pack. And Jeff and that as well. <laughs> this one's already got off to a flyer. <laughs> no, um, it's really weird watching the Triple H Rock match because they would go on to be like the two biggest names, especially when Austin was out injured. Yeah. So it's so weird seeing two of the biggest stars in wrestling ever have a match when they're just young and flying about on ladders and stuff. It's really, it's really weird, but it's fun. And it's a really good match as well. It was their big like we're here, we're we're here to I thought I said the, the Miz's theme. They came to play in the main event scene in WWE. And it was one of those matches where the loser didn't come out as a loser because it was The Rock. And while he did, didn't have the Intercontinental title anymore, he just went straight mm. in the main event scene, didn't he? Um, elsewhere on the card, this was, of course, the highway to hell, all about Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Undertaker. A match where Steve Austin was knocked out in a really bizarre way. Um, Taker's bent down. Austin kicks him in the gut and then Taker flips up like all the big men do. But on his way up, the back of his head catches Austin in the jaw and it KOs him and he's got no idea where he is. But despite that, it's still a, it's still a, it's still a fine match. I don't know how they do that. Mm. I don't know how... Imagine being knocked out in the middle of your working day and then carrying on your work. I mean, I could do that because my work's crap. Anyway, uh, <laughs> X-Pac versus Jeff Jarrett in a match where Jeff Jarrett was supposed to get shaved completely bald. But of course, it's professional wrestling, so the clippers didn't quite work. So they had to just chop it off with scissors. And it was gnarly. Then we had Edge. Yeah. Edge sort of making his first big pay-per-view appearance. He was teaming with Sable as a sort of... I think he was a... Was he a shocking um, partner? A shocking reveal to be a... Maybe. To I'm be sure. Sable's partner against Mark Mira and Jacqueline. I don't Excuse quite know. me. And then we had, obviously, the big ladder match with Triple H and The Rock. That's all the, the, uh, the headlines from SummerSlam 1998. A big card. It was good and respected. It had the big money main event, established mm. stars like Austin and The Undertaker. Then it had the sort of, we're here to play the coming out party, if you want, of Triple H and The Rock and their ladder match. It had, had, every, had everything. It worked from top to bottom, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really good. Do you think it, do you think it deserves top tier? It's edging towards top tier. I th yeah, it's got to go, go top tier. I think it's got to, yeah, go on then. It's we'll got to be top tier, tier as, for me as well. All the eights in the top tier. 88, 98, no pressure. 
2008. But next up, we have 1999, which was the big return of Jesse the Body Ventura, who was the referee for Austin versus Triple H versus Mankind, which is a match that's it's, it's surrounded by controversy because, of course, Mankind would win this match, then they would lose the title to Triple H the next night on Raw, which fueled rumours and all kinds of innuendo that Austin didn't want to drop the title to Triple H. Whether that's true or not, I've got no idea. What do you make of that? Probably probably true, because everyone loves and respects Mick, don't they? He'd have no problem putting over Mick. It's a nice guy, isn't Mick's he? a great guy, yeah. But I think Austin at the time, I'm trying to think, like, it was before him and Triple H had ever really properly feuded, mm -hmm. and maybe he just saw him as, like, Shawn Michaels' mate and thought, ah, oh, not him. <laughs> I'll give it a Mick instead. Um, Undertaker and Big Show took on Kane and X-Pac, which sounds weird, but it wasn't. Kane and X-Pac were a proper tag team until... X-Pac broke Kane's heart, which is, it's heartbreaking, but also it makes X-Pac look like a, a lovely noble man because he got, he got to take Tory out and he was so nice to Tory that Tory turned her back on Kane. That's how life goes sometimes. Anyway, X-Pac... Oh, that's an interesting reading of the situation. I've never heard it like that before. Oh. Yeah, I always thought it was just, you know, Tory being a, like, like Jim Ross likes to say, a Jezebel back in the day. But it wasn't X-Pac sort of wooed her on a weekend away because he won a match and then she aligned with him and turned her back on Kane. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I suppose so. I only know yeah. so much about this because Anthony Agogo wanted to put this angle straight down to hell, but I was like, whoa, whoa, friend. My friend <laughs> Anthony Agogo, calm wait, down. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously on straight to hell, often, oftentimes it's quite hard to say no to people I understand, especially quite intimidating people, but Anthony Agogo, one of the, probably the hardest man you've done a straight to hell with. Aye, ah, potentially. And you said, no, Anthony, come on now. You've got to play devil's advocate. I've got to be honest with you. It's, it got so, so awkward saying no to people that I just stopped doing it. It's just what people want to put in. And I go, yeah, that's good, that. <laughs> here's, a bit of a, here's a bit of a devil's advocate situation, but it's going down nonetheless, whatever you want. Anyway, SummerSlam 1999. We then have the lover or leave her street fight between Shane McMahon <laughs> and Test, which was better. <laughs> The stipulation is what it is. It hasn't aged terribly. Well, it wasn't good back then anyway. But uh, the match itself as a street fight was a good match. Yeah, two of the most... Oh, wait, I was, was I really going to say that sentence? I was going to say two of the most underrated superstars in <laughs> WWE history. Well, this is it. Shane McMahon back here. He was Vince McMahon's son. He was Simba. All that stuff. He got in the ring. He did his big bumps. He went home. He didn't affect any sort of main event storyline in the ring, in a wrestling perspective, he always was getting beat up by Stone Cold and people like that. That's the Shane McMahon I grew up on, which is why I had such a yeah. hard time accepting Shane McMahon circa 2016 to 2019. Terrible. Anyway, then we have the Lions Den match. Uh, Jeff Jarrett defeats D'Lo Brown with an assist from Mark Henry, who became he, he became the Euro Continental Champion. I think I nicked that straight from Kurt Angle, but of course he gave the European title to uh, Mark Henry because he didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> right, G great way to value the belt. There. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was, it was the Russo era, wasn't it? So everything was a bit. And Russo, actually, I found another thing from Justin, our good pal Justin, because uh, Go Jesse Ventura was on the card, and Jesse was on into politics and government and all that malarkey. Uh, Val Venus, the tag team of Val Venus and the Godfather, were booked on the show, but because Jesse was involved, they got removed because obviously one's a porn star and one was a pimp with all kinds of ladies of the night. And Jesse wasn't having that. And Jesse, whoever Jesse was associated with. Oh, right. Even though Jesse, ironically, Justin has pointed out, was openly advocating for legalisation of the prostitution. Was he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> Swings Jesse's him around the belt. <laughs> Jesse's an interesting figure. He yeah, is. I listened yeah. to a podcast with him and Jericho, and he's, he was, or was it with Austin? He was talking about being in Hell's Angels at one point, and he was in the army of some kind, and he was in government, obviously, and a professional wrestler, and he's a conspiracy theorist guy. I could listen to Jesse Ventura talk all hours of the day. I've got yeah. no idea what his politics are all about, but, you know, he's, <laughs> he's an interesting guy to listen to. Um, yeah. SummerSlam 1999. A lot, of, a, a lot of solid stuff there. Yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff. Just lots of stuff as well. <laughs> um, probably, for me, probably second top. Second top? I'll go with that. Second Why the top. hell not? Everyone loves it. You, you can't, you can't go wrong closing a show with, with Mick Foley winning a title. Yeah. Everyone loves a Mick Foley title win. Anyway, we then move on to SummerSlam 2000, which for me, burned in my mind, is Kane getting unmasked by The Undertaker. And that one picture that I'd seen up until Kane actually got unmasked, where the hair 
is really long and down his face. He's got the busted open head, and you can sort of see Kane's face. Glenn was looking a bit like Chris Benoit in that picture, I always thought, because I was, I was at school on Monday going, can you believe that Chris Benoit is actually Kane? <laughs> Just because he looked like him, kind of. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, but SummerSlam 2000, um, what are you saying? It's a it's a good one. This is the first this is the first big wrestling pay per view I think that happened when I'd become a wrestling fan. So I remember it quite vividly. Mm-hmm. I remember The Rock cutting a promo on one of the go home shows, just absolutely ruining Triple H and Kurt Angle for their love triangle with Stephanie McMahon, and The Rock saying that like The Rock couldn't give a damn about your marital problems, and everyone's going, "That's right, Rock, <laughs> you couldn't give a damn." So it was a really hyped triple threat main event, uh, and also. It, I think it was a really good show. My my biggest memory from it is once again uh, Simba himself falling from the side of the Titan Tron against Steve Blackman. Yeah, that was a fall. That was a fall. That's what I'm going to say about that. That was a big fall. How I don't know how you do that. How do you let you? How do you, if you're Vince McMahon, let your own son do that? Incredible. Vince is absolutely crazy. I got a reminder the other day of how crazy he is when one of our colleagues posted that gif of him. Doing his weird dance when he's like is getting slowly it, bigger and bigger. Is it what Kurt go be where he's sort of like doing the bird now? He goes. I Man. think it's the yeah. Yeah, he is yeah, one. He's one of a kind, that Vince, isn't he? But I that that main event, Rock versus Triple H versus Kurt Angle, remembered horribly so for Kurt Angle's horrible bump, taking the pedigree through the announce table. The table <laughs> collapses just before Triple H takes flight. Angle's knocked out, but somehow manages to carry on. Wrestling, eh? Bloody hell, if that was football, he would have been carted off straight to a hospital, but not in wrestling. You have to prove you're tough. <laughs> <laughs> TLC1 also happened on this show. This was a stacked card. Um, yeah. And I found out once again via my pal Justin that the lads involved in TLC1 were told to be spectacular but safe, is a direct quote. <laughs> and I want, I want you to tell me who said this to the lads involved in TLC1? Who in a higher up position in WWE backstage, told them to be spectacular, but safe. Uh, oh, I, love, I can't... Jim Ross? It was Shane McMahon. <laughs> no. Uh, he just didn't want them to overshadow his big four. Exactly. The we <laughs> see you coming, Shane, you bastard. Anyway, then we had Jericho <laughs> versus Benoit. Two out of three falls. That speaks for itself as a professional wrestling match. Uh, Kane unmasked by Taker, already talked about. China and Eddie... China would win the Intercontinental title because she pinned Trish and Trish was teaming with Val and if Val and Trish lost, they lost the title. That's how that one worked. Right. Yep. yep. Okay. <laughs> and then we had, uh, I think it was Taz versus Jerry Lawler and the Sweets. I think Jim Ross smashes the Sweets over Taz. Is that oh, the way it goes? Is that, yeah? this, is, this from, is that from this show? I think so. I love, Jim Ross's acting is amazing because he's commentating and he's going like, He's, he's choking out the king. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a so bitch, man, gets the sweetie thing. <laughs> yeah. And then he pretends he hasn't done it because him and Lola don't really like each other, but they secretly do. <laughs> so heartwarming. Uh, oh. And then to round things off, the piece de resistance of SummerSlam 2000 is the cat versus Terry Runnels in a stink, oh, fa- no. a stink face match. Well, isn't that regarded as... Is that regarded as one of the worst matches ever? No, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of Patterson and Briscoe at WrestleMania of the same year. But of a similar level, I'd say. <laughs> SummerSlam 2000's got to go in the best, hasn't it? It has, a, yeah. It's really stacked. It it's is. got loads of good action. Such... It's a variety show. You know, we always say that everyone loves a bit of a variety show in wrestling. There was high-flying, there was hardcore stuff, there was a big main event, there was uh, technical stuff. It's got to be top. I agree. And then we're going to a bit of a weird show to look back on. We're going to the height-ish of the Invasion Angle SummerSlam 2001, which, believe it or not, dear viewer, was a good show, even though it took place in the midst of the Invasion Angle. I think that's why people find it so weird to look back on and say it was a good show, because obviously the Invasion Angle was the biggest wasted opportunity in professional wrestling history, this side of Rusev. SummerSlam 2001. Uh, I remember me and my mate being absolutely gutted because we were big wrestling fans at the time. I'd go around his house to watch it. He'd get his mom to tape the pay-per-views and then we'd watch them the next day. And uh, I just remember us really wanting Kurt Angle to beat Steve Austin. Because we'd fully, we weren't, we weren't clever. We'd fully bought in Austin's heel turn as a, as a real valid thing. 
So we really wanted Angle to win. And then Austin got himself deliberately DQ'd. And we were, we were gutted, me and my mate. I remember us being like, no, he can't do that. And then he started stunning referees. And, ugh, despicable. It's a weird to look back on that summer, isn't it? Angle being arguably one of, if not the biggest baby faces in WWE. It's so weird. And he was so good at it when he got the the, the angles in the ring. At that, what period was that? Fully loaded, was it? When he got the the whole family in the ring. Oh, when he won, when he finally yeah. won. I want to say Unforgiven. But I don't un- know. Something like that. Someone will put us right in the comments below. But yeah, that match with Austin and Angle's got to be one of the best matches of that year. Never mind, it's just that pay per view. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, the Rock defeats uh, Booker T to become WCW champion. Oh. That's a thing that happened. The Rock defeating, well, to become a WCW champion. Me, me it's a my- weird sentence to say. Me and my mate were absolutely delighted at that one. Uh, we were like, oh, Rock's mugged him right off. He's WCW champion. He's not even in WCW. It was <laughs> The invasion angle when you were a kid was incredible because you couldn't realise how bad it was. Mm. Um, I still think it was all right, me. The given invasion what angle. <laughs> yeah, of yeah. course it was. It was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. <laughs> hey, in, in an ideal world, of course, they would have waited a couple of years for Goldberg and Hogan's contract to run down and then they could use him there, but I thought it was fine for what it was. Okay, it gets a hard time, the invasion angle. Uh, uh, then we had Edge and Lance Storm in what way? What, what, it's not the greatest Summer Slam opener because Kurt Angle versus Rey Mysterio exists from 2002, but it's up there in the conversation for one of the greatest Summer Slam openers in the history of Summer Slam. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's really, really good. And also, I just really like Lance Storm having a good match on WWE TV because he just seems he just seems like he doesn't always get the appreciation. He does offer smarky internet folk, but not in terms of the wider. WWE Universe, does he? He's making up for that by being good at Twitter these days. <laughs> yeah. I never, I don't follow Lance Storm, but I always see him coming up with a zinger or two on uh, Twitter getting shared about. Yeah. He does. He does Might do that. I don't know. I don't know what... Oh, I thought I'd lost you there for a second, but it's all right. I think. Good. Hello? Yeah. Yep, still... Yep. 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 Uh, We're on the same Wi-Fi, by the way, so how this is happening, I've got no idea. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> RVD and Jeff Hardy had a really good match as well, and a ladder match. Yeah. That I mean, was... that's what it was, wasn't it? That's those two doing their things. Yeah. How has Jeff Hardy gone throughout his career escaping injury as much as he has? I don't understand. It's, he walks under ladders. That's the thing that gets me. He walks under ladders. But on purpose, and he still gets away with all these death defying things. Crazy. Speaking of death defying, Jeff Je- Jeff Jarrett, Chris Jericho, <laughs> death defying when he was jumping off the top rope and getting gored by Rhino in midair, he twats his head off the floor. He's concussed in that match there when Stephanie McMahon, I think, was managing Rhino as part of the alliance. That's a weird timeline. Yeah, I, I always thought Rhino was Canadian because he's pals with all of the Canadian lads. Detroit, isn't he? He's near. He's nearly there. Um, but he uh, I, I was about to say that Jericho would, would sell anything for a fellow Canadian but I realised I was wrong but he is his friend <laughs> yeah uh, then we've, just to round things off from the highlights we had the light heavyweight versus cruiserweight title match which was uh, Tajiri versus X-Pac which was the last pay-per-view the light heavyweight title would have been seen was that a good match? It, it sounds like it would be yeah it was, it was alright for what it was but it was just the fact it was for the you know the light uh, heavyweight and cruiserweight title was a bit it sort of hamstruck and a bit in my opinion, but I, those were the highlights from SummerSlam 2001. It's up there in the top two tiers, it's got to be. I think we're looking at the bottom end of top tier. The bottom end of top tier, I'll go for that. The picture for this is uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, but it's cut, <laughs> out the two, it's cut out the 2001, so it just says A Space Odyssey. But remember, it's 2001. Next up, we're moving up to 2002, and I'm just going to just you know, not waste any time here and put this straight in the top tier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do we need to say? Shawn Michaels versus Triple H, Kurt Angle versus Rey Mysterio in what might be, unless of course you've got a fetish for big men bumping meat, the best under 10 minute match in WWE history, Goldberg and Lesnar aside at WrestleMania 33. Um, what else is jumping out with SummerSlam 2002? Uh, the main event, which was quite shocking at the time for uh, someone who'd grown up on The Rock being the biggest star ever. And then Lesnar just comes in and <clears throat> quite, I don't think it was a, it wasn't a squash, but he comfortably... It was a 2-0 by half-time. It was that hmm. sort of a win. Uh, Lesnar just sort of was being pushed really hard as the next... Well, the next big thing, obviously. Uh, and then... I, just, I think I still couldn't believe it, though. That, that was the clearest it's ever worked on me when I was a kid of, of having the newcomer beat an established name to get themselves over. And it worked. 
Yeah. And the crowd had turned on Rock, hadn't they? Going back and watching oh, it. They were booing him. Because he turned his back on her. He'd gone and done the films. The prick. Should have been <laughs> wrestling forever and a day. And not better in his life and making more money than he probably would have. Anyway, outside of that, we had fantastic matches. Edge and Eddie Guerrero mm. is something that's often, well, it's forgotten in my head quite a lot. It's a fantastic match. RVD versus Chris Benoit. Ric Flair and Chris Jericho. And Chris Jericho trying to get the confidence back in Ric Flair. We've all heard the stories on the Ruthless Aggression documentary how 2002 Ric Flair had lost his confidence inside the wrestling ring. The story goes that um, the finish was supposed to be Flair winning via figure four. Flair was like, nah, I'm not good enough to do it anymore, Chris Jericho. And apparently Chris Jericho was like, come on, Ric, you can do it. <laughs> Slap it on me, doing all that stuff. Um, it's nice. Yes, <laughs> just like that. So that's. I think that's all the highlights from SummerSlam 2002, unless I've forgotten any. No, I, I can't think. Well, do you need any more? Because that was. That's, no, a, that's, that's a really enough. good show. That's possibly, that's possibly the best one ever. It probably is in my mind, you know. Spoilers for the end of the video, but that's Jack's decision anyway. When we find out what is the best is Summer it? Slam of all time, yeah, we, we, we rank the top tier normally. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Yes, I've not done that's it. What I've happens not done here on these. this tier ranking thing? Yeah. Um, two thousand and three, we go to now, which of course is remembered for Goldberg's trip to the Elimination Chamber, which at the time really did piss you off as he had Triple H in his cycling shorts because of his groin tear or whatever he did. Making a mockery of Bill Goldberg, but when you look at things in the big picture, Goldberg was knocked down so he could get back his big win on the next pay-per-view. I think that's what the internet likes to tell me. I'm still pissed I, off by it I, being a WCW I used, to, I used to think that, but I've just thought there, would it not have just been better if Goldberg had also won in the chamber? I, I don't know. think so, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had a WrestleMania 19 rematch where Brock Lesnar was tapped out by Kurt Angle. That's a weird thing to look back on, Lesnar tapping out. I can't imagine Lesnar tapping out these days, no. Yeah, uh, it's like Cena tapping out, and he never gives up. And, uh, yeah, Angle, more miraculously, did this well because he had a torn hamstring or something like that, which he did on a, t a tour of Japan the month before, but he still did it. It wasn't as good as the Mania 19 match or the, the Iron Man match they had on SmackDown, which is the best one they ever had, those two, I reckon. Mm. Uh, but it was still really, really good. Eddie Guerrero won the US title against Chris Benoit, Rhino and Tajiri, a fatal four-way there, where Eddie was supposed to be a heel, I think, because obviously Eddie and Tajiri teed up for a bit, didn't they? And then Eddie turned on Tajiri, and then Eddie was supposed to be a heel, but Eddie was just so endearing while being a bastard. The fans loved him, and this was just a... a I think Justin wrote down the artful dodger with a mullet. And I think that's <laughs> lovely. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and then just in case you like your silly bollocks, SummerSlam 2003 saw what on paper should be a terrible match. But when you look at things, you've got on one side of the ring the best professional wrestler in the world taking on a black belt in one of the martial arts, I forget which one, in Eric Bischoff. Shane McMahon versus Eric Bischoff. A fantastic yeah. match. Shane, Shane got the win, needless to, needless to say. Oh, of course he did. He's the best in the world. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's a, uh, it's a, it's a decent one. It's it's the weakest in a run of very strong ones from two thousand onwards. But it's still it's still good. I think it's second top tier for me. Do we go second top tier? I think we'll so. Go there. We'll go there. Why the hell not? Even if I'm still annoyed by Goldberg not getting the big victory against Triple H in his cycling shorts inside the Elimination Chamber, two thousand and four. Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind has got to be Randy Orton in his little peach trunks <laughs> lifting the uh, World Heavyweight title in that match against an unknown de unnamed opponent. <laughs> now, I, I, used to, I used to think that why did Randy, if he knew he was going to win the belt and become the youngest ever world champion, a moment that's going to be replayed forever and ever, why on earth did he... Uh, can you hear that? Someone's at the door and it's all kicking off all around. Uh, I think it's Aiden from upstairs here. He causes all sorts of havoc every single day. Does he? We really need to get a leash from him. He's out of control, the young man. Out of just, control. He's just shouting at the bloke outside the door there. Shouting what? It, well, is it for Call the Holly? Yeah, it's for Call the Holly. He's getting the post in. Oh. Not shouting, I'm not thinking, arguing. I think meant berating the guy. Anyway. No, uh, yeah, sorry. I always <laughs> used to think, like, if Randy Orton... He was talking to him from the steps. He wasn't even at the door. What's going He's on? He's reckless. Absolutely anyway, reckless. Anyway, a loose cannon. Uh, Randy Orton, anyway. Uh, I remember thinking, if you knew you were going to win in a historic match, why would you choose the salmon pink or whatever, the peach short uh, trunks? But it does make it memorable. Whenever you see the, him wearing that, you're like, oh, it's that match where he won, where he won the World Heavyweight Championship. Hmm. Or the WWE... The World Heavyweight Championship. World Heavyweight, yeah. 
Um, outside of that, we had Kane and Matt Hardy in a death till do us part match, where Lita, of course, was forced to marry Kane. <laughs> Wrestling, eh? Uh, Kurt Angle versus Eddie Guerrero was good, but not as good as previous eff efforts from the pair, the WrestleMania match and all that malarkey. Uh, Undertaker against JBL, which continued the weird SummerSlam tradition of a DQ finish. But that was all right, though, because Undertaker got to put JBL through the roof of a limousine, which was almost ruined because, as you know, it's gimmicked, it's professional wrestling. We don't want JBL to actually hurt himself. A fan allegedly got on the roof of the limo, didn't he? And sort of nearly went through until the security guard pulled him off. Oh. Nearly, ruined the, nearly ruined the illusion for everybody. I forgot all about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And, and then we can't talk about SummerSlam 2004 without mentioning Diva Dodgeball. No, a shoot no. fight. <laughs> a shoot fight was happening at SummerSlam 2004. We had the Diva Search contestants on one side of the dodgeball court. The WWE Divas on the other side of the court. They were told, go out there and call it on the court. Well, not, no, just shoot. Shoot the dodgeball, just like they did in the film Dodgeball. And the Diva Search people won, which caused heat backstage because the Diva Search people were seen to be better more athletic, I guess, than the, the <laughs> WWE Divas. And then I've got written down here, the, the, the losing women's faction would have to endure wrestler's court with Val Venus' as prosecutor and Triple H as judge with Ivory acting as a defence attorney for the, for the Divas. What? What's they lost going the game on there? Of dodgeball. They lost the game of dodgeball. So was he on the... Was he on yeah, the Divas the... for losing? <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. Upsets happen, don't they? Hereford Town beat Newcastle United once upon a time in the FA Cup, which they remind us about every single year for some reason. Yeah, they Upsets do. happen. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Ronnie Radford. Never forget the Ronnie name. Ronnie Radford. Because they do remind us every single year. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like that, the Diva Dodgeball. Anyway, SummerSlam 2004 is a weird show. Yeah, it is. I don't know where to put it. I, my instinct says middle, but what do you think? I was thinking middle, yeah. Okay. Because some of the stuff is aged like milk, but there was some good wrestling on the show, and we did see Diva Dodgeball. <laughs> well, I didn't know that story about Diva Dodgeball. I, 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 I knew it. about it, but I didn't realise that Val Venus was the prosecutor and Triple H was the judge with Ivory as the defence attorney. That what? is weird. What? I thought Ivory was a good egg. Why would she get involved with this bullying? Well, she's sticking up for the lasses, isn't she, surely? Oh, she was the defence yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, that makes sense. 2005 we move on to now, Jack. SummerSlam 2005. <laughs> memorable for one match in particular in my mind. Well, there's, a lot, there's lots of matches it's memorable for, but Shawn Michaels making an absolute mockery of Hulk Hogan, maybe. <laughs> yeah, he mugged him off. I think he really <laughs> mugged him off. It was funny. But then I, dis I, dis I got into a not, a dis not an argument, but a disagreement with uh, Kenny McIntosh regarding this match. Uh, because Kenny thinks that it was Hogan who got one over on Michaels. And I think that's not true, if you watch nah. the match. He says, I can like, see how... Sorry, go on. Well, he said, I was talking to Kenny about it. I was like, isn't it funny when Michaels is selling and bumping all over the place ridiculously? And Kenny's like, I and watch what Hogan does. He just stands back and lets it happen. Oh, whatever. I can't agree with Kenny on that one, I'm afraid. <laughs> I can't I agree. Think, well, you know, Mike, he, Michaels does make a tit of Hogan in respect that he makes Hogan's offence look a bit weird but also Michaels makes himself look like a massive petulant child which sort of Aye, defeats may, maybe that's what Kenny meant in fairness maybe yeah, that is what maybe, yeah. sure. it's, 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 it's a two edged sword there. but I should point um, out this was before Kenny was friends with Shawn Michaels so I don't know I don't know what <laughs> he's friends with Hogan as well isn't he oh god he's friends with all of them Oh my god. I wish I was friends with wrestlers. <laughs> anyway, this was the event I've got written on my notes here where Mohammed Hassan was going to win the title from Batista until that misjudged, mistimed angle happened on SmackDown. I just thought I'd throw it in there because it's a weird thing to look back on mm. all these years later. Of course, topical because of SummerSlam 2020 and the match against Seth Rollins, we had the custody of Dominant Mysterio ladder match. You don't go to court to sort out the custody of a child, you settle the differences inside the wrestling ring. And of course, that match, apart from the silly stipulation, had the iconic moment of where the F is Vicky, <laughs> as she wasn't sent out at the right time. All the fun of the fair. Rey Mysterio falling from that ladder like he did when it sort of crumpled and twisted below him was absolutely terrifying. Silly bollocks professional wrestling is the best professional wrestler. I don't care what you say. <laughs> did it ever get... Did it ever get undone in kayfabe that Dominic was Eddie's son 
As far as I'm aware, no. So Eddie, oh. even though even though we're here with this story, I think we had Samoa Joe on Raw a couple of weeks ago saying Dominic Mysterious, Mysterio, sorry, has had little to no professional wrestling training, therefore he can hit a gnarly 619 just out of instinct, natural, it's just a natural God-given ability he's got. How can that be true when he's, he's the biological son of Eddie Guerrero? That's ju- what I'm asking. I just feel like as well, even back then, no, sorry, especially back then, Dominic was clearly Rey Mysterio's son. Like, he looked like it. I know Rey wears <laughs> a mask, but we all know what Rey looks like, really, if we've watched any late WCW. And he just is clearly Rey Mysterio's son. I can't, yeah. I can't allow that. It was clear that Dom was a filthy animal all along. Yeah. Uh, on, top, on top of that, we had Edge versus Matt Hardy. In a weird match, because obviously we had everything with uh, Edge and Lita and Matt and what happened in real life outside the ring and Matt Hardy leaving, then getting rehired. And then we had this match at SummerSlam that was over. I think it was less than five minutes because of the, the ref stoppage and all the blood. And I, I, it was booked that way. I don't think it was by accident. No. And it was just weird how they would want to get it over with so quickly with an angle everyone was so invested in because everyone was saying, bring back Matt. And they did. And then they did that. It was weird. Imagine if they made Matt win. The reaction would yeah. have been tremendous. But Vince Ryan, doesn't... Uh, Vince, doesn't sorry. Vince probably thought Matt was weak for letting him steal his girlfriend or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Well, probably. It's probably true. Yeah, I know. He's a prick and he Vince McMahon. <laughs> uh, then we had Randy Orton losing to... Uh, sorry, Undertaker losing to Randy Orton after a fan got in the ring. But it wasn't just any old fan. It was Cowboy Bob in a mask. Yeah. This is when Cowboy Bob was getting involved in the Undertaker's business. On top of that, we had uh, Chris, uh, Chris Benoit sorry, defeating Orlando Jordan in the opener of the night for the United States title in 30 seconds or less. John Cena versus Chris Jericho. I can't remember what Jericho was meant to be doing originally, but he was like, Vince, I'm going away after this event. Let me do something big. So we had the rapper versus the rock star storyline. I don't want to call Chris Jericho by his actual nickname there because that's, you know, the old thingy of rock and roller. Oh, bit, yeah. Bit, yeah. Iffy. The bit iffy, isn't it? Um, um, yeah, okay. I guess so. And like then we connotations had... of like dictatorship and all that. Do you mean? Yeah, right. Okay. Bit iffy, isn't it? Fair enough. Just a bit iffy. Fair um, and then we had uh, uh, something we need to mention is Kurt Angle versus Eugene because Eugene sort of put the gimmick to one side here, and he wrestled a good wrestling match. And for what it was, is that Aiden again? He I just think, left I, the I office. I feel like here. that was Aiden again. Yeah. He needs to calm oh, he down. This it, young he man. It. Bloody hell! He's everything okay <laughs> to him, Aiden. Let us know you're all right, pal. Um, Kurt Angle versus Eugene, I thought was a pretty good wrestling match putting the gimmick to one side and it's a weird thing to say yeah yeah true um, is this the one where Kong comes out and just slaps him immediately it's a proper intense wrestling match yeah it might be that one I've seen some Angle or match with Angle and Eugene where Angle's entrance is still going on all the music and everything but Angle just gets straight in the ring doesn't pose or anything just goes bang it's so it's so brutal <laughs> But I, we've been through all of that there. Very much, you know, a newsworthy show. It wasn't boring, but it wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So second bottom? Second bottom. I'm yeah, happy with that, that makes one. sense. Believe me, that says 2005. I've made a pig's ear of these pictures, and I do apologise. We're moving on to 2006 now, Jack. When I say SummerSlam 2006, what comes to mind? Uh, oh, balls. I've lost it in my notes. I always feel like that's a bad thing because surely it means that nothing jumps out. But maybe I'm just... Maybe it's just because we're thinking of every show. Oh, I really can't find it, Ross. I've really, Hulk I've, Hogan's last ever cheers. WWE match. Oh, yeah, that's but he, what yeah, but he won, didn't he? That doesn't work for he me. Bloody that doesn't won. work. I don't like that at all. Against, I think it was 26-year-old at the time, Randy Orton. He lost to Hulk Hogan in what was still, I think, Hulk Hogan's last WWE match. Um but apparently, once again from my pal Justin, the Hulkster would miss the go-home roll for SummerSlam 2006 with a partially torn meniscus, which I think is in your knee. A-level PE coming in there. Yes, I did do A-level PE, don't laugh. Um, <laughs> uh, was he reportedly injured by simply standing up off the sofa at home? Well, right. <laughs> right. So despite the, the meniscus tear as a result of standing up from the sofa at home, he still beat the young... In his prime, well, before his prime, really, Randy Orton. On top of that, we had Edge defeating John Cena in uh, Cena's hometown, which, of course, is Vince McMahon having a right old bit of japery, a bit of a laugh at the expense of the hometown yeah. hero. But then Cena would go on to beat Edge in his hometown. So, I suppose but this was a weird match because the stipulation was 
If Edge got DQ'd, because Edge, of course, was the champion, Edge would lose the title. But somebody didn't appear to tell Lita oh. this because Lita would always be on the apron trying to get herself involved and therefore result in a DQ. So that was a bit of a, a disconnect there. We had DX defeating the team of Shane, Vince, and about 100 different heels. <laughs> um, we had Ric Flair versus Mankind, which was my personal favourite match, match of the night. It was that, good, yeah. really good fun from two just old fellas. Yeah, it was a, a bit... Heel McFoley as well is weird, isn't it? Strange. It's good. Him at one night stand, I think it was that year, he was like, we need to thank, uh, at ECW one night stand, obviously, he's like, we need to thank the innovator of hardcore, this, that, and the other. He's, you, you feel like he's building up to say Paul Heyman, but no, Stephanie McMahon, the leader of ECW <laughs> in the invasion. Heel McFoley's yeah. good. Um, Flair would have, this is just a weird thing, Flair won this I Quit match by threatening to hit Molina with a barbed wire baseball bat. Melina and Mick Foley had an on-screen sort of friendship at this time, and I just think that's weird. I, I, I'd never understood. So apparently, right, I, I've not actually read them, so I don't know how true this is, but apparently Foley's first book's really good, his second book's also meant to be good, and then I think it's the third one, where a lot of the book is just devoted to how good Melina is. I reckon somebody fancies Melina. I do, but apart from that, fully also... <laughs> no, I'm joking, no. <laughs> um, great times, on great, sw- great days, great times, yeah. Do you want to tell the, the story from the, the wrestling show? What? I just... what? Which part? Mine and Melina's friendship has so many chapters to it. <laughs> well, no, the, the, the thing that they had you do, which Aye. didn't make the air, which I find one of the most intriguing angles <laughs> in professional wrestling history that almost happened but didn't... Of all time, in any promotion... Any promotion, because how you, how you could come out with this being the baby face that you are <laughs> on this internet wrestling scene, it beggars belief because, no, nah, well, you couldn't. It never, it never aired, could... thankfully. No. I'd like to clarify I didn't write this. Um, it was during the time when I was trying it on with all the women in WCPW for some reason. So Tegan Knox, Jen, Susie. It was incredibly awkward, especially the one with Tegan because I didn't actually really know her. Like, with Jed and Susie, it was fine, because I know them, but not, not shooting the angle with Tegan. And then they wanted me to, <laughs> to... We shot it as well. It just never made the final cut. I had to ask Melina to help me search for something in a storage cupboard and then shut the door behind us. The camera stays outside. And um, you hear me basically try it on with her in the dark, and then you hear her batter me, and then she leaves and goes, Damn kid. And then I crawl out, having been beaten up by Melina, and I go like, yeah, I should have seen that one coming. Trying to assault, assault, assault the woman <laughs> in the storage cupboard. And the, one of the most surreal moments of my life was standing in a storage cupboard, side by side with Melina, with her boot in the wall and me going, ow, ow, it was so weird. Oh, she's a trooper. She's an absolute trooper for doing that. That footage exists somewhere. Well, it's never going to see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on from there, though, uh, during the production of some, the SummerSlam commercial, I think we need to mention it, we had the big fight between Batista and Booker T. Depending on who you read, more people say Booker T got the better of the animal, which is shocking because he walks alone inside of a pit of danger. <laughs> um, just worth mentioning. SummerSlam 2006, where do you think it goes? Uh... I, I, I don't know. Were you thinking middle again for it, or were you thinking a bit better? I'm thinking middle, yeah. yeah Around on, the then. middle area yeah. somewhere. We'll put it in the middle. Why the hell not? Uh, moving on to 2007. What's, I think this was the bit, one of the... What, <clears throat> maybe second to you and Melina and that footage, Aaron. But potentially the biggest missed opportunity in professional wrestling history. Maybe third okay. behind the invasion. The jackass lads went, went to be involved in this one, but it all went wrong after the Benoit mm. thing. Right, they right. Were the, they were on the on the poster, weren't they? They got released where all of them like they're buried from the neck down in the sand, and Umaga's there in the background. They did the angle on Raw, where um, uh, Chris Pontius and Steve Oak just get the bejesus beaten out of them because they wouldn't stay down. And Umaga's like, "Will you stay down, lads? I meant to be big and tough here. You're sort of ruining my gimmick." And they're like, "Ah!" Oh. <laughs> so, Umaga has to actually beat them up a bit which is quite Doesn't funny to look back properly, on what, is he, what move does he do that actually hurts one of them is a splash a, he does a big splash off splash. the top doesn't he oh uh, right yeah. I think it's Steve-O he hurts <clears throat> by doing that who do you think out of the jackass lads does the most crazy stuff it's either Steve-O or Johnny Knoxville I can't Aaron Aaron's an underrated Aaron. one oh. Aaron McGee Danger Aaron 
Yeah, he does do Remember mad get, stuff. Getting kicked by a donkey in the nads. <laughs> and he, he had the, La- the Lamborghini and the tooth thing. Oh, God, oh, yeah, yeah. Terrible. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I, jo- yeah, Johnny Knoxville and Steve are the two that stick out, I guess. But Aaron, shout out Aaron McGee. Um, and they said Aidan McGee there. That's a very different person. It anyway, is. SummerSlam 2007, what else is sticking out for you? The first ever singles match on pay per view between Big Match John and Big Match Randall. Which is mm. actually a good match, probably because we'd never really seen it before on pay-per-view. Uh, and Cena won after quite a long match, but it was good. So I've got no complaints about that one, despite it being Cena Orton again, because it was the first one. It's funny how that works. And also, yeah. uh, an equally good match, Grey Carly versus Batista. I think where it's Car- was it Carly who continued the SummerSlam trend of DQs and screw finishes? He did that to keep the title from Batista? Yes, he won by DQ, or, lo- or lost by DQ. And but kept the title. Kept the title, yeah. And of course, we had Booker T versus Triple H. But even though Booker T by this point was King Booker, he was doing some of the best things in his career, he still had to lose to Triple H because, of course, he did. <laughs> Triple H was returning from injury, to be fair, at the time. Oh, but King, King just let King Booker have one win over Triple H. Yeah. Why not? Uh, I- uh, as the, at the time, because I was sort of half in and half out of wrestling by this point, I remember finding King Booker really boring. And looking back, what was it on? Because it's really Bye. good. Don't know why. It's a simple gimmick, but he did it very, very well. Yeah. And I just think of, in the notes here as well, uh, Booker T might have lost this match because he was about to go on a 60-day suspension for being one of those lads who got found to be uh, the signature pharmacy oh, thing. He was oh. one of those lads. And he got suspended because of that. And then when he got that suspension, he was like, oh, hell nah. <laughs> that isn't my game. And he, he quit. He quit the company soon after. Turned up in the main event mafia in TNA. And doing his own commentary and doing a really weird... <laughs> in the a running. really weird... A, <laughs> and then that really weird accent when he talks about me and my people and the chicken and all that malarkey. Uh, Have you seen that one? I feel like it rings a bell, but I, I'm scared to discuss it on camera. <laughs> yeah, it is weird. You need to see it if you haven't seen it. I'm just, yeah. 2007 SummerSlam, Jack, before we dig ourselves as... The whole two uh, big to get out of. Where are we going? I'm maybe, saying near the bottom. Well, I was going to say middle, so should we put it in second bottom then? Bearable, yeah, we'll go bearable. Okay. Because Orton, Orton versus Cena was good. Yeah. But outside of that, we're struggling. Fair enough. Uh, SummerSlam 2008, my main memory is uh, Undertaker versus oh. Edge. Oh, you got a different one. That works out well. What's your main memory? Chris Jericho punching Shawn Michaels' wife in the face. By mistake, we should add. <laughs> what? By mistake? Oh, yeah, by mistake. Yeah, 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 by mistake. Yeah, he didn't actually just go out and smack her in the face. But apparently, he got backstage. I saw my notes about research earlier. My research. Trying to make myself sound like a journalist. Research earlier. Apparently, she was getting her lip seen too because her lip had obviously blown up after being smacked in the face by a multi time world champion. And she was like, Is that all you got, Jericho? Is that all you got? Bring what it a, on. What a trooper. What Could a trooper. Be. Bet Sean wasn't happy, though. Yeah. I bet what's he going to do? That? What's he going to do? Smack- Jer- Jericho could batter Sean in real life, I feel like. Do you, yeah, why I? He stood up to Brock Lesnar, didn't he? Did. He did. Multiple uh, times. And Goldberg. and Goldberg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but interestingly, this was the first event to fall under the PG banner. Yes, SummerSlam 2008 was the first PG event in, well, not maybe not in the history of the company, but the first of the PG era. And this was the show, of course, where Chris Jericho hit a lady in the face. Undertaker versus Edge wrestled inside Hell in a Cell. Edge was sent straight down to Hell. Quite literally, the real place, not just under the ring. He burned in hell. Uh, Edge, by the way, he wanted to take a tombstone on top of the cell, but that that, that was scrapped because it was a bit too dangerous. <laughs> Why? Because it might have given way. Yeah. Oh right. Basically, oh, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Imagine that. Mick Foley falling back first was bad enough. Edge falling head first mm. could have been catastrophic. Mm. Um, outside of that, I just thought it was weird to mention those two things in the midst of this PG era show. Uh, Batista and John Cena was a proper, I, I love this match, me, a proper slobber knocker, just two big meaty lads hitting each other really, really hard in a match that didn't last that, that long in, you know, in terms of main event matches in WWE. And then, weirdest of all, Triple H carrying the great Carly to a fine match. Triple H, when he wants to, is really good. Even as late as 2008, which I didn't, mm. I didn't realise because I I I'm always thinking like Triple H's heyday was the early 2000s. But no, he could do it even then, even as late as 2008. Oh, eight, oh, where he sorted out, you know, when he his muscles sort of disappeared in 2004, five yeah. time. This is when he got proper shredded again. And I remember thinking, wow, that's an incredible body transformation. And also, as well, 
he, I'm just thinking there he had a great match with Daniel Bryan in 2014 so what am I talking about he had it for ages mm. silly yeah. he, who's, so, he gonna, who's he going to retire against that doesn't matter I'm going off topic I th- we're going to speak about that in a couple of points time because there was a sort of retirement am- angle thing okay. wasn't there at a, at a SummerSlam I didn't go quite the plan anyway 2008 <clears throat> lovely 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 yeah go on yeah that main event's really good yeah, and the angle was shown and Chris Jericho mm-hmm. and Rebecca was also great. And as was the great Carly. He's always great. 2009, what's sticking out in your mind? Another great main event, uh, Jeff and Punk. It's, it's like they gave the emo lads at school a go at the main event and they did well. They did really well. It was very good. I think it was a TLC match as well. Yeah, World Everweight title, which CM Punk won, and an Undertaker attacked the heel CM Punk afterwards to send the crowd home happy at the biggest party of the summer, which Jeremy Piven, this was the year he called it Summerfest. Oh, was it? Oh, Piven. Bloody Jeremy Piven. What was he doing? Piven. Was that also um, when Dr. Ken got thrown out of the ring and just <laughs> cracked the back of his head? <laughs> Ken, Jong, Ken, Ken Jong. Ken Jong, yeah. Mm, yeah. From the hangover. Uh, this was also well, sorry Jeff Hardy would appear on the Smackdown after SummerSlam 2009 and then he would be gone that was his last pay-per-view match for seven and a half years emotional oh, that until is that very night sad. in WrestleMania 33 yeah uh, talking about the greatest SummerSlam openers we've heard about Lance Storm versus Edge and Rey Mysterio versus Kurt Angle Ziggler versus Rey Mysterio on this show this is in the conversation unbelievable match this was before NXT main events that does Matthew Gregg's head in so much on the Cultaholic Wrestling Podcast because the near fall sequences down the stretch in this match is absolutely fantastic uh, but if it was two German lads doing it Matthew would be on the edge of his seat so I don't know what he's talking yeah, about yeah he would be Yeah, masturbating furiously I've never heard anyone hate Johnny Gargano as much as Matthew does <laughs> hate him <laughs> Uh, outside of that we had DX versus Legacy which was also a good match we had Orton versus Cena which looking back was a bit of an overbooked mess what did you make of that one? yeah it was um, I, I think it was one of those ones where the match was restarted maybe one or more times mm. and interference and all kinds of stuff the stuff that would have worked if it was Austin versus Vince in the Attitude Era but it wasn't it was Cena versus Orton in 2009 <laughs> And then just to even the scales up a bit, we've seen the good stuff at the start. Punk and Jeff, Ziggler and Ray, DX and Legacy, uh, The Bad, Orton and Cena, and Christian versus William Regal. A match that on paper should have been very good, but I think it still holds the record for the shortest ever SummerSlam match. Probably. At eight seconds. WWE, yeah. WWE put up a YouTube video this week of uh, 10 really quick SummerSlam wins, basically. Uh, and that was one of them. And he didn't even take his... Christian, right? Regal's an idiot. Because he goes to take off his jacket after the bell's rung and he just completely turns yeah. his back on Christian. And Christian's like, all right then, unprettier. One, two, three. Very weird. And that's a shame, that, because, you know, 2009, yes, it was later on in Regal's career, but he could still do it then, couldn't he? That's a great matchup, yeah. Very sad. Yeah. So 2009, where are you saying? I think that's all the headlines from that show. Where did the last one go? 2008, quite in lovely, lovely, lovely. Oh, this one's either just below it in lovely, 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 or all right. I'm not sure if the main event saves it. I reckon all right is a bit too harsh. Okay. So I'm going to go lovely, lovely, lovely. Fair enough. There we go. 2010. What is sticking out in your oh, mind about 2010? Oh, we got another bin one. It's been a while since the bin. It's been a while. Yeah, what, yeah 93 was the bin. Oh, this is bin as well. Yeah. This has to be bin because of the booking. Because the booking was really bin worthy. It's. Uh, it's, I've mentioned him again, it's Kenny's most viewed video on Inside the Ropes YouTube channel. It's, Why do you know that? Because I, <laughs> I was on a bit of a Kenny binge the other day. I was watching quite a lot of his interviews uh, because who was, it, who was I enjoying the ones with? Edge. Edge is really a fantastic storyteller and uh, mm. so is Jericho. But I was watching the Wade Barrett one uh, and the, the most viewed clip is uh, Barrett explaining how they found out that they were going to lose that match because they all thought it was a joke at first. They were like, ah, because someone said something like, and then it'll get down to Gabriel and Barrett, and then Cena will go over, and Barrett was like, <laughs> good one. And then they were like, no, like, genuinely, Cena's, Cena's going to beat you both. So I think the original plan was for Nexus to win, and then something changed. Whether that was, because I've seen people say it was Cena, I've seen people say it was Vince, I've seen people say other things, I can't remember what they were. Yeah. But something changed late in the day, heading into SummerSlam 2010. And as we've seen... The hottest angle in the company at the time was the Nexus. You would have thought against these established stars, a win for the Nexus would have been a no-brainer, but no. 
Cena survived a DDT on the floor, popped back up like it was Nout, and then beat it was Barrett and Gabriel, wasn't it? Two on one situation and one. Yeah, he did. It was a last minute change and one that just doesn't make sense. How different things could have been. I wonder what. I wonder what everything would have happened. What everything would look like now. Probably wouldn't be that different to be honest. But and you've got to wonder how different things could have been if the original plans for Team WWE had have come through. Because instead of Daniel Bryan. He was hired, obviously, after he was choking Justin Roberts with a, a neckerchief. Great Carl, he was supposed to be the seventh man, wasn't he? Which was would have he? been a barrel of laughs. Fantastic. <laughs> I would have loved that. <laughs> um, uh, but I, sorry to mention as well, Daniel Bryan's return was spoiled. Because obviously nobody knew who the seventh man was. The big shocker reveal was Daniel Bryan. Half an hour before Bryan walked out, whoever runs WWE social medias, the website and whatnot, put the return on there. Oh. And ruined it half an hour before it happened. So well done to them. Didn't they, what, what was sorry. it? Sorry, what was it recently? Only this year, or maybe last year, there was a, a result on a pay per view that got spoiled by Brian again. The wasn't it? it was the of a T-shirt. The, Kofi Kingston the, and, and Brian. Mania. Yeah. Yes. They released they the T-shirts t-shirt. on the shop. Oh, we all knew Kofi was going to win anyway, but still. What's it like? Yeah, Daniel Bryan and technology doesn't mix together. Maybe that's why he likes trees so yeah, much. Yeah, maybe. Um, the sourness continues on this show as the Big Show defeats another hot angle in the company at the time, the Straight Edge Society, three on a, in a three-on-one handicap match. And I know that Joey Murphy was supposed to be injured or something during this match, but how are man? The yeah. Big Show's been around for forever and a day by the time 2010 comes around. Let the Straight Edge Society get a victory there. Um, then we had a 20-minute W title match between Sheamus and Randy Orton that ended once again the SummerSlam tradition of a massive DQ. But there's one person who did like SummerSlam 2010, and that was Cameron, who recently, of course, rocked up in AEW because this was the event where we saw Melina versus Alicia Fox. Best match of all time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Poor I find, Cameron. I find Austin a bit mean in that one, though. Because he goes... His, re- his reaction is fantastic. <laughs> it's good, yeah. Head <laughs> in hands. Was he really <laughs> expecting it to say, oh, the Midnight Express versus the Rock and Roll Express? <laughs> He was, expe- he was expecting her to say Stone Cold versus The Rock, WrestleMania yeah. X7, <laughs> yeah. everyone's go-to, and he didn't hear his own name, and he couldn't believe his own look. Um, but SummerSlam 2010, oh, it's in the bin already. We don't need to talk about this anymore. It was a bit of a crap, well, it was a very crap show, wasn't it? Weird booking, weird booking. Uh, 2011. Kevin Nash. <laughs> what did he The was? Summer of Punk was flying along at a great rate of knots until... A phone call happened or something. Kevin Nash comes back. And then somehow the summer of punk ends up as Kevin Nash versus Triple H. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, a weird timeline. So Nash, Nash claimed that it was Triple H who texted him saying, Text, yeah. Stick the call. winner for me, brother. And the winner was CM Punk because Triple H messed up being a referee. Which was a good match until that point between Punk and Cena, to be fair. But then... It then emerged that John Laurinaitis may have been involved. And then eventually, I think it was that Kevin Nash had texted him himself. Mm. Was that how it... Was that the final answer? That rings a, that rings a bell. I should have dived into this a bit deeper. I don't deeper. know. I just, I just remember a text being involved somehow, some way. And yeah, it's the summer of Punk was going along. We'd been through Money in the Bank and that greatness. And then we got to SummerSlam. Cena versus Punk for the real, champ, the real world... Not the five-star real world champion. The undisputed champion in WWE. Uh, Triple H counts despite Cena's leg being on the ropes. It's a screwy finish. Out comes Kevin Nash to stick the winner. Del Rio then comes out to win the title, which is often forgotten. What a mess. But outside of that, there was some good stuff at SummerSlam 2011. Orton versus Christian continue then. Their bloody brutal feud. Mm. Uh, they had a no-holds-barred match. They, them two are just great together, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, really Wade good. Wade Barrett and Daniel Bryan had a proper, like, no... No bollocks throwback wrestling match. Wrestling match, whatever you want to say. That was a great match. Obviously, it would be with Ray Barrett and Daniel Bryan involved. And then we had the team of Kofi Kingston, Rey Mysterio, and Jomo taking on R-Truth, The Miz, and Del Rio. Yep, Del Rio was in this sort of throwaway six-man tag match at the start of the night when he became world champion, which was weird once again. That's a great match. Go oh, back and watch that. It's a good match. I've not seen that um, one. Well, I must have seen it, but I can't remember it. Yeah, mm. that team there are Kofi, Jomo, and R-Truth. No, sorry, Kofi Mysterio yeah. and Jomo. All the flips. was a great team. Uh, all the flips. No other fists. Um, 2011. 
It depends, because there was some good stuff. We've just mentioned three good matches there. It just depends how much the main event angle affects your perspective at all. The main event affects it quite a lot for me. So I think maybe top of all right. We'll go top what of all right. What are you thinking? I think all right's about fair. Fair enough. When you're way up, when you're way... It, it, I know it's the main event match and many shows are one match cards and whatnot, but you can't... You, but just based off what happened before, you can't put too low. No. It was a, it was a load of bollocks, but you, could have, you can't put it down too low. 2012. This is the, the sort of Triple H retirement-ish thing oh, yeah. that went wrong. Because Triple H is brutalised by Brock Lesnar in the main event. I think it was the main event tonight, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it was, happened? Oh, what was it called? The match had a tagline. It was the perfect storm. Was it the perfect Triple storm? Triple H versus Brock Lesnar. The perfect storm. <laughs> Which doesn't fit for me at all, but yeah. No. Yeah, <clears throat> Triple H versus Brock. Triple H gets brutalised. He gets beaten down. He's down in the middle of the ring after Brock Lesnar's walked away. And they're trying to milk the crowd for every single applause. And, you know, go on, Triple H, that they've got in them. But it never happens. Triple H starts to get booed. It's really awkward. He walks away as if, you know, he turns around and looks at the crowd as if he's retiring. The the, the noise didn't match, no. match the images. It was so weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else you say about that. I, it, it's be, Triple H has spent so long as a heel, it's hard to cheer him when he's when he wants you to feel sad for him. Mm. I think he could these days. He could effectively retire and it would be fine. But when he loses to Baron at the next WrestleMania or whoever, but <laughs> oh no, but um, but yeah, I don't, I didn't, I didn't like it. It didn't work. But the match, I think the match was good. Yeah, the match was good. Uh, then we had C uh, John Cena sorry, versus CM Punk in the Big Show in the Triple Threat match for the WWE title. Uh, what was it? Big Show submitted to two submission moves at the same time, which caused the match to be restarted. And then it was Cena who hit his AA, and then CM Punk threw Cena out the ring, and then CM Punk pinned the Big Show. He thanks to the AA. He stole win the one, Ross. A really nice creative finish there. Yeah, good. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, and then we had the best match of the night was probably Dolph Ziggler and Chris Jericho and yet again another another SummerSlam opener that's in the conversation for the best of all time Um, then we had uh, Daniel Bryan that could have been with Charlie Sheen what could have been there I don't know why I mentioned it it didn't even happen (laughs) do you remember when Charlie Sheen appeared on Raw via the (coughs) Skype call that was supposed to be setting up something involving Daniel Bryan and uh it was it AJ Lee by that point? It might, I think it was AJ Lee by that point, just about. Maybe she I can't GM. quite remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she restarted the triple threat match with Punk. Yes, yeah, she did, didn't so, she? Yeah, yeah, she was the GM. I yeah. assume. So that, that nearly happened, but didn't. I guess that would have added something to the show, maybe. And then we can't speak about SummerSlam 2012 without mentioning our pal Fred Durst. Why? He did that in the camera, didn't he? Oh, did he? he? Oh, he got, he, he got kicked out, even though he was the front man for WWE's favourite band in the world ever. That's a direct quote from Tony Chimmel at WrestleMania 19. <laughs> he did the finger and he got kicked out the arena. Fred, <laughs> come on. You can't, he's such a rebel, isn't he? Can't believe I know, it. what's he like, yeah. But 2012, um, yeah. It, uh, good names on the show once again, but a lot of it didn't click. Yeah. It's, it's meh, it's it. meh, is it meh? The main event was good, though. Yeah. I don't know. The main event was good, but you know the, the the awkwardness at the end really ruined it. Mm-hmm. The the finish to the triple threat match was you know people might say you know the dusty finish and all that, but I, I liked the way that CM Punk was able to steal a, uh, steal a win there. Ziggler and Chris Jericho was good. Uh, is it all right? I'm gonna maybe all right. Maybe all right then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bad certainly does wear it down. 2013 though, are we going back up the board here? Oh yeah, I think so. It had some good. It had two very good matches on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brian versus Cena in the main event uh, and then a really sad ending but an effective one I think with Randy Orton cashing in and Triple H turning heel again and Punk versus Lesnar which was like a proper match of the year contender as well so yeah. really good really good stuff on 2013 I think yeah, this is the one if you want to see a biggest party of the summer that doesn't really have any kind of nonsense involved Unless, you know, in the grand scheme of things Orton and Triple H that was you know building up Daniel Bryan for his big win at WrestleMania yeah. 30. At yeah. the time, it wouldn't have felt like that. I, I realised that. But, you know, storytelling. This was just like a, a show for wrestling fans who like the wrestling. Not the sports entertainment side so much. More the wrestling. Yeah. We had lots of good wrestling matches. Spoke about Brock and Punk there. 
I think they were supposed to have gotten a, a standing ovation by everyone backstage when they got back, which shows how good that thing was. No, I'm sure. Uh, Brock, had... I'm sure Brock loved that. <laughs> sit, sit down, yeah. lads. What are you like? Eh? <laughs> not me. Not I don't deserve that. Um, we had a world heavyweight title match between Del Rio and Christian, which a lot of people would say it was match of the night if it wasn't for uh, Brock and Punk. Fair enough. Looking Although back. Cena and Brian was very good as well, though. Yeah, remember, Brian and Cena are the same. I remember uh, Brian horrible kneeing finish. Him right in the face. What a finish. Yeah. It might be the first time he'd used the knee as a... I can't remember. Maybe. Mm. It would be around that ball, mm. ballpark, wouldn't it? And then we have Bray Wyatt in his... I think it was his first televised proper main roster pay-per-view match as a singles guy against Kane in not an Inferno match, but a Ring of Fire match. What mm. the difference is... I have no idea. No, same. But I've got no idea. Those are the headlines from SummerSlam 2003. Uh, 2003? 2013. It's been a long day. Where are you going for 2013? Oh, top tier. Top tier. Top tier. I agree with that. Straight in the top tier. 2014 we move on to now. Brie Bella and Steffi McMahon. What oh, a match. No. Against all the odds, they pulled it out the bag. I don't care what you say. When people say SummerSlam 2014, that's not the match that I typically think of. But you know what? <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. Um, what What is the match? Well, that would be John Cena and Brock Lesnar. Because Lesnar destroyed John in shockingly one-sided fashion. And he ruined the next six years of Brock Lesnar matches. Because <laughs> Suplex City, bitch, became a thing in this match. Yes. However many suplexes there were, Germans and all kinds, Cena pissed right in the eye. Uh, sorry, Lesnar pissed right in the eye, John Cena. Got a, sh- a shocking victory. I don't think anybody saw coming. Obviously, we've been through the streak ending victory for Lesnar, but I don't think anyone saw this happening to John Cena in 2014. Monumental. It was meant to be Daniel Bryan, apparently. Who he was going to do He got injured, though, didn't he? Yeah, he got injured, so he had to drop the title. And then Lesnar just destroyed Cena anyway. I can't believe they kept yeah. it the same. The balls on WWE then to keep it the same. Uh, and I, I got it, you know, we've heard obviously SummerSlam 2010 in mind. Cena doing a bit of the old Hogan, the old Michaels politic in his way through the through the main event scene. Maybe not so much as those two. That might be a bit unfair. But we've certainly heard of rumours John Cena doing it. John Cena being up for it. I, 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 it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> I, I can't believe it I, but, but I guess maybe when it's Brock Lesnar it's someone he respects from OVW and back in the day and stuff I don't know oh I, that class of good wrestlers the Shelty B and all that malarkey mm. anyway outside of that we had Ziggler and Miz no the match wasn't as good as No Mercy 2016 but it was still good all the same it lasted somewhere in the 8 minute ballpark region I guess it was hampered by not being as long as it could have been. A lumberjack match between Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose uh, chaotic and rowdy and all the stuff you'd expect from Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose in 2014. We had Roman Reigns pre-big push against everyone's will and disdain. He defeated Randy Orton in a very popular win for Roman Reigns. It's weird looking back at Roman Reigns in 2014. How things just go sour and more sour as the air goes on yeah. in 2015. Then we had Stephanie and Brie in what was a great match. A great match. Lady Ball's proven she can still go with the best of them. That yeah. came out wrong. No, no, she's, I, I she, understand. She, she, she could still do it. Yeah. Uh, and then even Rusev and Jack Swagger, Mr. Jake Hager himself, even though it wasn't a normal flag match, it was still all kinds of fun. If it wasn't Rusev, you wouldn't say that, but yeah. Okay. It was a fun match. Okay. It was a fun match for what it was. Uh, SummerSlam 2014, though. Oh. Um, Where are we going? Lovely, it's got to be lovely. Or yeah, top, I was going to say. Top? I was going to say lovely, lovely, lovely. We'll go lovely, lovely, okay. lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Why not? 2015. I can't believe we're nearly at the end, sort of. I know, this video's gone on for several years. I can't believe it. Uh, 2015 2015 is ingrained in my mind for John Stewart. Oh, no. Costing John Cena the WWE title (sighs) because he didn't want Cena to equal... Was it equal at that point? I think it was equal. Equal Flair's Flair's record. record. Yeah, would have been. I think he equaled it when he beat AJ at the Rumble in 2017. Mm. So, yeah... Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's a thing that happened. That's a thing that John Stewart, of course, was off the telly and off the films. I first saw him in Big Daddy, I think. He was playing a, the dad. A much smaller man than John Cena and Seth Rollins. And much older and presumably much frailer. Even though he was trim and in shape, he, he got was. a chair. He puts uh, the chair in John Cena's midriff and that allows Seth Rollins in his white attire. Oh, he looked sexy to retain. The title, well, retain the WWE title and win the US title, didn't he? Because it was yeah. title for title. I remember thinking, I remember being so excited for that match. 
we just started at the old place. Well, I just started at the old place anyway. I was only a few months in. And I remember thinking, oh, this is, Seth Rollins is the best in the world. And then you had yeah. to have Jon Stewart's help to win, to win the match. I was really <laughs> disappointed. And yeah. then we had The Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar. I think this was the first time these two had, meet, had, meet it, had met since uh, the streak ending victory for Lesnar at WrestleMania 30. Lesnar doing the Kimura. The bell rings for some reason. I can't remember what made the bell ring. I think it was just Taker an accident. Then, was just an accident. It was a, 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 real, a, real, a, a deliberate kayfabe accident, but I, never, I don't think they ever explained it. No, I don't think they did either. Uh, Taker then takes advantage of this pause from Lesnar, hoofs Lesnar in the lads, puts Hell's Gate on Lesnar, Lesnar passes out, Taker kind of gets some sort of retribution for his streak ending, but not really. It would have been better just to see him win clean, but then again, you've built up Brock so much, do you want him losing clean to The Undertaker in 2015? I don't think so. Yes, we got that fantastic Hell in the Cell match out of this sort of back and forth here, but it was a bit weird, wasn't it? It was. Who won the Hell in a Cell match? Lesnar. Did he? Good. When they, they stripped the ring back. Yeah, Did yeah. He? I feel yeah. like he might have... D- I don't know who won that last one. Anyway. I think it must have been Lesnar. Because okay. they stripped the ring back, didn't they? And mm. did an F5 on the, F5 on the oh, wood. Oh, on the boards. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. I hope he did. I can't remember. Why can't I? It's been a long day. Anyway, then we had uh, sort of two members of the Shield versus two members of the Wyatts. And it could have been better because once again, we're going back to my pal Justin's uh, Justin's pieces on cultaholic.com. It'll be shared on the Twitter over SummerSlam weekend. Don't worry. You'll see them. Uh, reports indicate that for SummerSlam, Bray Wyatt, Luke Harper and Eric Rowan would have faced Roman Reigns, Dean Ambrose and a mystery partner. Who was that mystery partner going to be in the summer of 2015? Uh... Teaming with the Shield, Savio Vega, almost as good. Okay, Sting. Oh, Sting. We Sting. But an injury, an injury to Rowan led that to be sort of downsized oh, to a two-on-two match. Very what sad. Could have been, eh? Yeah, that would have been fantastic. But I think Sting came back a month. Was that the autumn of 2015 when he was doing with Seth Rollins and Clash of Champions and the statue and all that stuff? That yeah, because he, autumn, he came this? back to help them at Survivor Series, didn't he? So yes. around then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, oh yeah, that would be, yeah, we're talk- yeah 2015 we're talking about here. Yes, right, yeah. so that was, yeah, talking there. Uh, 2015, where are we going? Uh, Boy, bearable, maybe? Yeah, maybe bearable, although it's just weird finishes, but decent action. Maybe, yeah. uh, it's, it's bearable or all right, and I'm not sure which, I'm really not sure. John Stewart means it's top of bearable okay, in my book. fair enough. Top of bearable, not the bottom of bearable, top of bearable. 2016 we go to now, which almost saw the start of what would have been one, one of the most hellacious matches, feuds, rivalries in WWE history. Obviously, the main, was it, the main, it was the main event, wasn't it? We had uh, Brock Lesnar versus Randy Orton. Mm-hmm. The elbows, Orton's b- brain is all over the ring. Who comes down to save the day but Shane O'Mac himself, who was very much morphing into the best wrestler in the world, Did even Shane though he should never him? be. He came down, didn't he? He got, F, he, he got F5'd in a pool of Randy Orton's blood. I do not remember that. Shane McMahon, he was, he was the, uh, the co-general manager of SmackDown with Daniel right. Bryan, and this was SmackDown. Oh, when they were the cool dads. Yeah, yeah okay, the cool yeah. dads. Yeah. Who promised the land of opportunity, but then stole all of the opportunity yeah. for themselves. Um, <laughs> um, so that looked like it was setting up Shane McMahon versus Brock Lesnar. That never came to pass, for whatever reason probably for the best, really, looking back on what Shane McMahon did to Roman Reigns in Saudi Arabia and stuff like that. Imagine if he was doing that to Brock Lesnar. <laughs> but then again, we could be getting that with Raw Underground. I think that's where that's going, to get Brock Lesnar and Shane McMahon inside oh. the Raw Underground pit. <laughs> God. 2016 SummerSlam, though, what's sticking out for you? Uh, the match that I was most looking forward to at the time was Rollins and Bala, but obviously it got a bit hampered by the fact that Bala got injured midway through and still had to win and then vacate. It was for the first ever Universal Champion as well. And then had to vacate it, was, it the next night. Went back and watched a bit of that match in preparation for this. And it was every single... I forgot it happened. Every single time the Universal title was on screen, it got booed out the building. <laughs> oh, yeah, everyone hated it at first, didn't they? Everyone yeah. hated how... Yeah. yeah. I mean, not many people are keen on it now, but you sort of got used to it, haven't you? But it was just weird looking back how much people hated that title when it was first introduced <laughs> outside of that we had AJ Styles and John Cena having a fantastic match where AJ Styles 
one clean, which mm. this was like a few months in AJ Styles' WWE tenure. A big clean win over John Cena at the biggest party of the summer was something a lot of people didn't expect Vince McMahon to do just because of TNA, just because of AJ Styles' size. Styles' size. Yep. It's a long day. Um, well, what else? We've got? I've got written down here, Sami Zayn and Neville teamed up to defeat the Dudley Boys. <laughs> What? I've, I've completely forgot about that. And I think I think that's the match where Neville's Balak came out of his came out of his shorts. Oh a little right, bit. okay. Remember yeah. That one? yeah, I remember the incident, but I don't yeah. remember the match at all. I yeah, can't that's even a tag team. That. That, yeah, that's a tag team that happened. Wow. And I guess we have to mention going back to Lesnar versus Orton. They didn't tell Mike Kyoto that was the finish. So Mike Kyoto's reaction was <laughs> genuine. He had no idea that finish was coming. It was planned, by the way. Randy Orton had his, his head split open by Brock Lesnar's elbow. Terrifying stuff. And then this is where we got Chris Jericho, who also didn't know this was planned, squaring up to Brock Lesnar because he thought Lesnar went too far. Until Vince McMahon and Triple H allegedly had to pull back Chris Jericho and tell him, Chris, it was all part of the storyline. Don't worry, pal. You've been worked, you big Mark Ray. <laughs> but why don't they just let everyone know that's going to happen? Why would... I'm not, I guess to get Kyoda's real reaction, but... I get it God. for Kyoda, but why are people backstage going around not... I, I thought they always had, like, a big board up somewhere. We had this a board. This is what's happening here. Yeah. 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 They definitely had a board anyone, at one of the WrestleManias. In case anyone takes a photo of it and puts it online, like the... Like the... Uh, was it one of the developmental talents did that recently? I yeah, can't remember. Yeah, for Keith, Keith Lee's big win, wasn't oh, it? Oh, that was Got just spoiled. a picture. That was just a picture of Keith with the two pounds. <laughs> but SummerSlam 2016 where are we going um, they tried something different didn't they with that and then Styles and Cena was a great match I yeah. think I think alright I think alright as well fair enough Balor and, Balor and Rollins still did well despite Finn's because it was mm. early on in the match wasn't it when his sort of elbow shoulder whatever went wrong yeah. went wrong uh, 2017 this was the big meaty men Meat Castle oh, main that, event. That main event was really fun. That was really It was good. fantastic. Braun yeah. Strowman, this was Braun Strowman and his pomp, I reckon. The meme among men, I used to call him back in the day, just the stuff they had him doing. I think this is when he hoied a chair at Roman Reigns for the first time, maybe. I might be wrong in saying that. He, de- he definitely did some devastating stuff to Brock Lesnar, threw an announce table and stuff like that. That was just four big men bumping meat, and that's what wrestling should be from time to time. It's lovely stuff. I just remember that match seeming to take place almost entirely in my memory anyway on the outside and people just running around and grabbing weapons and throwing things and running through things great stuff yeah Lesnar would escape with the title though wouldn't he off the top yeah, of the air I think he yeah. did didn't he? Um, what else happened at SummerSlam 2017 from the top of your head so one of the things I remember the most from this one was the fact that Shane McMahon made himself the focal point of the feud between AJ Styles and Kevin Owens which is really annoying because you've got AJ and Kev two of the best wrestlers on the roster and they could have just gone out there and had a really good series of matches but Shane had to make it all about himself and his weird feud with Kevin and he was the special guest ref and something went wrong for the US title like the wrong person won because someone forgot to kick out or something I think it was a a botch on Shane's part ruined this match didn't it? I hope so (laughs) <laughs> I really hope so yeah this, this resulted in Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn being fired by Shane McMahon and oh it was just this was this was Shane McMahon continuing the ascent to being the best wrestler in the world and oh dear wow. what a load of bollocks but back to the good stuff at SummerSlam 2017 uh, we had Debar their title defence against Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins that was a fantastic match then we had the Usos and New Day on the kickoff show that was the, I think that was the event where they had the kickoff show match and just said well Put us on the kickoff show. We'll show you what we can do, Skippy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, that's yeah, that's what they said. Yep, that's what they said. And then the bards. We, we spoke about Kevin Owens and AJ Styles blighted by Shane McMahon. Then we had Cena and Baron Corbin. I'm not saying this was bad booking. It was just weird in the grand scheme of things because it looked like, for all purposes, Baron Corbin was going to be the next big thing in WWE. He'd won the arm bar at WrestleMania 32. He'd won Money in the Bank. He'd lost money in the bank after he tweeted something wrong or something like that to somebody on, on the Twitter machine. And then here, against John Cena, he just got absolutely obliterated, which nobody saw coming just because we all thought Corbin was going to be a next big thing in WWE. Yeah. And this led to this led to rumours that Corbin, because what he did on Twitter and maybe some more stuff backstage, I can't remember, he was going to get released. It was that much of a, a resounding defeat, and it's weird to look back on. 
considering his 2018 where he became Constable Corbin and now in 2019-20 where he's King Corbin. Did did Cena just not like him or something? I know that you've said there that it might have been because of backstage stuff, but I remember Cena seeming... Cena in that match seemed really gleeful to be burying Baron Corbin and I felt bad for I know. Baron. I felt bad for he him. Got, he, he got... Do you remember that, that, that segment on Raw when he was the constable and then he was in the ring with Shane and Stephanie and Vince and Triple H, obviously, oh, and they're all going, we're, we're going to give you the new era and what you want. And Baron was supposed to speak and you could see Vince McMahon say to Triple H, cut him off, cut him off, something like that. And then the, all the testers Baron Corbin got on air. I know it's a sort of baptism of fire and prove you can be this main event guy we're pushing you to be, but it, it seemed quite harsh. You didn't see it happening to everybody. No. Especially yeah. Roman Reigns in that period of time. Yeah. Anyway, he got a few, the point. few hospital passes, and it was really sad. Uh, anyway. Then we obviously had more bad stuff when Rusev lost to Randy Orton in no time whatsoever. That was weird. Yeah. But I think Rusev got his win back in no time whatsoever soon after. I think that happened. It might have just been in my dreams. I can't remember. Jinder Mahal. WWE champion Jinder Mahal defeat Shinsuke Nakamura is a thing that happened. This is when Shinsuke Nakamura was more than what he is now, obviously, which is just Cesaro's foreign pal on SmackDown. <laughs> yeah, They've done it again, haven't they? And Cesaro's foreign. So for, to be Cesaro's foreign pal, <laughs> you're even less important. Wow. <laughs> and, uh. then, and then I just need to mention this because it's something I completely forgot that happened. Around this time, SummerSlam 2017, WWE started selling those shock cage toy things so of course at takeovers we had a shark cage at SummerSlam 2017 we had a shark cage we had Big Show versus Big Cass with Enzo in the shark cage fantastic stuff when Enzo greased himself up and tried to slip out of the bars yeah and yeah (sighs) things happened 2017 bearable (laughs) yeah because of the main event the main event was really 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 good yeah, so, and the, those two tag matches as well. But I guess oh, maybe, the, the new um, day, the new day match wasn't on the main card, so I don't think we can count okay, it, can we? Fair uh, enough, fair enough. Can we? No, I don't think we can. So it's either so bearable... Yeah, we, had, we had two good matches, bearable, and a lot of bad. Bearable or all right, I can't decide. We had two good matches and a lot of bad, so I reckon, I reckon bearable. Fair enough, but near, fair enough. Near, near, the, near the top of bearable. We'll put it near the top of bearable. Uh, then we're moving on to 2018. Bloody hell, we're nearly getting there. Oh, my God. This was the night where it finally happened for Roman Reigns. The boyhood dream came true. Three years after he was supposed to probably beat Brock Lesnar before Seth Rollins cashed in at WrestleMania 31, he finally gets the big victory. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> You've been pleased uh, about that. Whoa, get in. Um, uh, no, this I... is also the night where uh, Ronda Rousey defeated Alexa Bliss. Imagine predicting that Alexa Bliss would win that match, yeah? <laughs> Chumps would do that. Eh? Yeah, um, it was very then we funny. had the Miz and Daniel Bryan uh, having a, having their after talking smack. You're thinking, "Wow, it's finally here, the big singles match." But it really didn't hit the heights it should have. No, it didn't. Uh, Samoa Joe uh, was it Samoa Joe defeating AJ Styles at this event? Um, uh, it sounds about right. It sounds like yeah, it might be around the Wendy times. Oh, um, oh, was it not? Was it not? Uh, was it not Daddy Gate where Daddy Joe Gate won yeah. by DQ? But AJ kept the belt. Mm. Oh, that was Sounds that was way. that was that was that when he when, said he'll be their new dad to the kids yeah. and then Wendy. Is that when Wendy yeah. was in the crowd with the, the little? I think what so. What's she called? Yeah, the little girl. I don't know. The little girl. Can't remember <laughs> her name. Monroe is. Sky. Alan. Oh. Alan. Uh, and then we had obviously what was probably the I guess the biggest thing of the night was the birth of the man. Charlotte Flair gets inserted into the title match involving Carmella and Becky Lynch for no good reason whatsoever. I still can't remember the kayfabe reason why, but it didn't make any sense, did it, at the time? It's just the same as the real-life reason. They just love Charlotte. <laughs> yeah. Think. And then, obviously, Becky doesn't win the... Or Becky loses... Becky lost... No, I didn't think win Carmella, the title. I think Carmella, Carmella was, was the champion. champion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Charlotte won. Uh, Becky lost the plot. Becky went ham on Charlotte. The man was born organic reaction from the crowd made that moment 10 times better than it already was Becky was off to the races where do we rank SummerSlam 2019 2018 18 sorry uh, uh, alright to to lovely 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 maybe alright maybe alright I'd say the top, the top of alright yeah, just because of foul right. because it was weird Samoa Joe and AJ Styles' matches around this time weren't hitting the heights they should have been hitting uh, the Miz versus Daniel Bryan certainly didn't hit the heights it should have. Oh, uh, man. 
That, yeah, this that is when I did, a lot better. This is when I was on that conference call with Samoa Joe, and the guy asked him, one of the journalists asked him, wasn't me, thankfully, do you think that this match with AJ Styles will be as good as your, your incredible matches in TNA? And Joe just couldn't be asked and went, no, I don't think it's going to be as good. <laughs> <laughs> he was it, right, though. It was, <laughs> it was so <laughs> awkward. It was really awkward. Oh. Uh, so there we have it, SummerSlam 2018 in all right, despite the birth of the man. I think it's fair. Yeah. Uh, 2019. The big there. party. It was a big party, Ross. I really enjoyed this event, <sighs> but it might have been because I was drunk in Aspers watching it with my mate. So <laughs> that, I've got really good memories of it. It was a really good night. Uh, Even though you were drunk with your pals, that seems shocking. Well, I know. It, oh, it just seemed like every, all the right things happened. Rollins beat, yep. Rollins beat Lesnar because he promised us that he would, and then he did. This is weird. This is, you know, <laughs> Rollins was the biggest baby face in WWE just about. And we were all on side with Seth Rollins going to win the, the title once again from this mercenary arsehole, yeah. Brock Lesnar. We all wanted to see it happen, and it happened. Yes, Rollins got the second win of 2019 against Brock Lesnar in big matches at big pay-per-views. And then he went and did interviews outside of the company and made himself look like a massive arsehole and we didn't like him anymore. I feel like <laughs> I feel like the sentiment had already started to change because they'd kind of ruined him a bit by forcing him and Becky Lynch into that storyline together. Yeah. But this kind did of Did you know that this they were rescued, boyfriend and girlfriend? I'd, I'd heard on the grapevine. But then this sort of uh this sort of remedied that a bit and then he started saying all this sort of stuff. And then uh then the fiend happened in Hell in a Cell, so yeah. Per- like, for what it was, it was the perfect debut. So many times they get these sort of debuts wrong, don't they? But the presentation, the theme, the mannerisms in the ring, it all worked. It all clicked for me. The severed head. I might remember that when that got revealed. Uh, Bala yeah. played his role on his way out the company to go and get married or whatever he did in his own personal life. Yeah. Uh, that was a great, a great debut for The Fiend. It's a shame what happened afterwards. Then, of course, we had Charlotte versus Trish. I know what you might think about Charlotte, but the right person won there. Got to be Trish, hasn't Yeah, you? and it was one of Surely. Trish's best matches as well. It was a good match. Yeah. Then we had Kofi and Orton ending in a weird <sighs> DQ where Kofi yeah. didn't look very valiant whatsoever. Kofi's son got involved and then Randy came over and then Kofi got DQ'd, I think it was. That didn't really do any favours for Kofi, especially. Uh, we had Kevin Owens. Whew, defeating Shane McMahon. If Kevin Owens lost, he would have left WWE. So thankfully... He defeated Shane McMahon, then defeated Shane McMahon once again on the first SmackDown on Fox. It and got Shane got bit, fired oh, and then it, it, all, the it all got a bit. It should have been the end of it. It should have been the end of it. But then when Shane came out, and oh. But that, that's not a knock on this SummerSlam, though. That's just on the angle, the storyline as a whole. Yeah. And then <clears> maybe uh, one, of, one of, if not the highlight of the night, was Goldberg versus Dolph Ziggler. <laughs> and no matter, no matter how many times Big Bill would put Dolph down, Dolph always thought that was lucky and he wanted to come back for some more. And I think it was, it was it three pinfalls in the end? Just three spears. Um, there was only spears. one pinfall, but then he did two extra spears afterwards. The funny bit was the music hitting again and again when Goldberg yeah. was going to come back out. Oh. It's the best thing, Dol- outside of Raw Underground, where somehow uh, Ziggler's now Brock Lesnar. The best thing Ziggler did for a long time. Yeah, now, I yeah. <laughs> but SummerSlam 2019, a lot of good stuff there and a lot of weird stuff at the same time. I was thinking lovely, lovely, lovely. I'll go lovely, lovely, lovely. I yes. think that's fair. There we have it. The 33rd event takes place this Sunday. There we have the previous 32 in our tier ranking thing. But as is tradition, here on the tier ranking thing, some primetime Gary YouTubing. Why do we do it? We're going to rank <laughs> the best, the, the lads who are in, the lads and lasses who are inside the best tier to find out which is the best SummerSlam of all time. So just whatever comes to mind first, Jack, is SummerSlam 92 better than 88? Oh, that's a really hard one to start off with. Uh, I'll go for yeah, because we're English. Yeah. We're English. We're mental. We're off our effing heads. Is 98 better than 92? No. No, I don't think so. Is 2000 better than 92? I'll go for yes. (laughs) I know. is a Space Odyssey better than 2000? It's 2001. I messed up the pictures. No, it's, it's 2001. not. No. no, it's not. No, it's not. It's 2002 better than 2000. Yes. And finally, the big one. Well, it's not the big one, is it? I think I know what the answer is here. Is 2013 better than 2002? It's not, but it's still a valiant effort from 2013. 
So there we bloody have it, everybody. We've come to the end of this tier ranking thing. We've done every single SummerSlam. We have found out that 1993 and 2010 are in the bin. They are the worst of all time. And 2002 is the best SummerSlam of all time. Jack the Jobber, how do you feel? Just so tired. Uh, but They're long, it, these, aren't they? They take a while. Aye, but I'm looking forward to this year's, Ross. And I can't wait to see all of our coverage following it as well. Way I predictions. Adam Pacitti will be doing a solo live stream. It's like we're back in lockdown once again, everybody, for the biggest party that we're not seeing <laughs> coming. We'll have uh, no no reactions because Pacitti's streaming. We'll have graded. We'll have WTF. We'll have what happened at. We've got takeover coverage as well. You're involved in that. I am not. What's happening with the takeover stuff? Um, oh, you, will have, you will have seen the takeover stuff. This goes out on Sunday. Yeah, it you doesn't know matter. what's happening. Doesn't matter. Yeah, but I <laughs> doesn't won't, matter. I won't have done the. I won't have done the reaction to that though. I'm mean, just in the contest, but I'm reacting to AW, aren't I? But anyway, they've seen all of it. Or if you haven't, Cry. if you haven't, yeah. check it out. Today there's AEW stuff on the channel because AEW happened last night as well. Because the basketball. All go. systems go here at Cultaholic. Mm. We never bloody stop. One day we will. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've been Gary YouTube from Cultaholic.com once again doing these Gary YouTube things thank you once again to the Gary YouTube over there who has joined me to rank every Cheers. single SummerSlam in this tier ranking thing if you disagree which you probably do let me know what you think in the comments down below I can't wait to read it all and cry myself to sleep see you next time everybody